called last week due to the alarming and wholly disturbing revelations that became public uh, after an LA Times investigation. I'll begin the meeting with an opening statement, then we'll take public comment, and then have a robust discussion with representatives of animal services and other key players in the management and operations of the department. And uh, this meeting will be held as a uh, uh, meeting of the chair, there being no other uh, members present other than myself, uh, Paul Carras. There is no action item before the committee today, but my goal is to help the department find solutions to the problems that exist at the Department of Animal Services and our many animal shelters. And today our panelists will be uh, Animal Services Interim General Manager Annette oh, last week due to the alarming and wholly disturbing revelation that, that became public uh, after an LA Times investigation. City employee I'll begin the meeting we with an opening statement of and we'll take public comment and then have a robust discussion we'll follow up with representatives of with Animal Services next and other key players in the management and operations and of the leaders, department. Uh, experts from the veterinary profession, and some of the hardworking and dedicated volunteers, some of whom stepped forward as brave whistleblowers to bring this crisis to our attention. And following the two hearings, I'll issue a report identifying the problems and putting forth a roadmap of solutions to these problems. For those interested in offering public comment, I would ask you to focus on the operational issues of animal services and the city's animal shelters and if you have ideas for how to improve those operations. Not only will we scrutinize the indefensible and inexcusable situation of dogs being caged, sometimes for many months at a time without exercise, we'll also focus on the other problems in the department, bring transparency to these important issues. The most important part of animal services mission is to properly care for unwanted and abandoned animals and help place them in loving homes. It's clear from the recent headlines that animal services needs to do better and it must do much better. And I and the rest of this committee perform an oversight role regarding animal services, not a management one. But let me be clear, I take my role extremely seriously and I will be using the bully pulpit of this committee to demand changes and will not go away until those changes are implemented. Getting down to specifics, we know that there are some serious challenges that, the, that animal services faces, and it's time to address those issues once and for all. These include inadequate staffing, which has an impact on day-to-day -day animal care in our shelters, exercising dogs, coping with the COVID pandemic, which continues to impose operational constraints and reduce staff avail availability, as well as the availability of much needed veterinary care. The latter includes the shortage of spay neuter services, which leads to a log jam in the last stages of the adoption process, thus contributing to space shortages in the shelters, not to mention the larger matter of pet overpopulation in general. We're also aware of ongoing maintenance and repair issues, a coming transition in the operation of the Northeast Valley Shelter, and hiccups in the crucially important volunteer program as we all struggle to come out of the peak of the pandemic and get back to normal, whatever that will mean going forward. There also is a question about evidence dogs and dogs awaiting hearings. Are there not ways in which they the time they spend in our shelters can be reduced, and how can they be treated in a much more humane manner? Also, are there other places in which they could be held rather than reducing space for dogs which could be adopted? If you're getting a sense that, that uh, a lot of factors play into these issues that we'll be discussing today, I think you've recognized an important aspect of the challenges that the department faces in this unique moment in time. One problem can lead to another and another and another. 
I want to note that Animal Services has come a long way in improving conditions and adopting more humane policies over the years. Um, when I first got elected, uh, I think we were euthanizing around somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of our, our animals, and uh, obviously that is not the case today, but there's still a long, long way to go, and I intend to help push them to get there. The issues facing us today should remind everybody that the hard work of saving and taking care of our companion animals never ends. Again, for those waiting to offer public comment, please try to keep it constructive. If you have good ideas, we want to hear them. If you identify a real problem we weren't aware of, that's what we need. You will each have one minute to speak, and we will take 45 minutes of testimony. Mr. Clerk, please read the agenda item description for everyone, and then we'll start public comment. Very good. Okay. Discussion item. Discussion of urgent Department of Animal Services operational issues to include, but not limited to, animal intake and care, adoption programs, shelter maintenance, and staffing. All right. And uh, Mr. Hirsch, uh, can you read some additional instructions members of the public who would like to offer public comment this morning please call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting id number 161-602-6414 and then press the pound key press the pound key again when prompted for the participant id once admitted into the meeting press star nine to request to speak since this is a special meeting, you will, be have an you will have an opportunity to provide a one-minute comment on the subject of the hearing. General public comments will not be taken. Like the councilman said, we will be providing 45 minutes for all public comments. I will start calling out speakers by using the last four digits of their phone numbers. If you are called on to speak, please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and start providing your comment. Caller with the last four numbers, 3543. Three. Please state your name and let us know what, uh, what you want to speak on. Hi, my name is Tom Keish. I'm a volunteer at North Central. I have a general comment. Do I start now? Go ahead. I find it funny to call this an emergency meeting as the whole reason I switched from walking dogs to the private rescue to North Central was that I was informed that dogs weren't going out but once every four to six weeks. And that was five, five years ago. Since then, I've put in thousands of volunteer hours and have made dozens of suggestions on how to improve things. But unless we, the volunteers, have implemented changes ourselves, most things have not changed. If anyone on this call actually wants a serious conversation, reach out, stop by the shelters on a monthly basis, talk to any of us with boots on the ground for at least 20 minutes. Nearly nothing is hidden at any of the shelters. The best of the staff have either already left or are actively looking for new jobs. The current system overtaxes the good and doesn't get rid of the worst. Those in the middle don't see a point in doing any more than is asked of them. It is a system that encourages a fast slide toward the bottom. We all know that Los Angeles can do better. Visit the shelters monthly. Thank you. I yield back my time. Thank you. Uh, caller with the last four numbers, 7348. Please state your name and uh, begin to speak. Hi, I'm Danielle Howard. I volunteer at South LA. I'm hoping the committee members today will present to us details related to what you learned from finally visiting your city shelter. I'm not sure where she went. Um, she will be calling back in, I'm sure. Call her with the last four numbers, 0565. Please press star six to unmute yourself and state your name and uh, please start your comment. Hi, my name is Katie Arth, and I'm a volunteer and foster dog for the South Valley Shelter. Um, I'm glad that the city is reviewing this. 
because it shows that we need to evaluate more than a save rate for what means success for the shelter. Not euthanizing and keeping dogs alive doesn't mean giving them the care that they need, and the city needs to provide more resources for the overcrowded shelters instead of only relying on volunteers and the staff that they have right now. Um, I look forward to hearing more about what you can do because I believe that LA can and must be better. Thank you. Thank you. Caller with the call in user number one, please uh, press star six, state your name, and begin your comment. Does anyone know what that noise in the background is? I have no idea, sir. If everyone but the speakers could mute. Thank you. Caller with the last four numbers, six, two, uh, 6281. Please state your name and begin your comment. Hi, good morning. Um, general comment. This is for Mr. Kreff, Mr. Gross, and Ms. Ramirez. This is not new. We have been calling the LA Animal Commission on a week or bi-weekly basis, and we even called the PAWS. They knew about this issue long ago. It's just you were warned that the world is going to find out, and it's it. And another thing that is not focused is the cat. No one is cleaning their cages. We all know they won't, shit, they won't eat when their litter box is full of shit. This has been so long, and we have been called fake news repeatedly time by L.A. Animal Service commissioners. It's about time the world, or at least the city of Los Angeles, finds out. Thank you. Thank you. Caller with the last four numbers, 5903. Please state your name and begin your public comment. Caller with the last four numbers, 5903. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your comment. Hi there, uh, Jenny Godby. Um, I'm just a pet parent. Uh, I've heard of the meeting and I have ideas. Um, so first of all, we yep. need money. Hello. Um, yep, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, are there two of us? I think we have two yeah, people. I was, told to oh. I was told to unmute. I'll wait. I apologize. Go ahead. I think you called 5903. I was trying to unmute. I think I'm unmuted. Yes. Okay, I apologize. Okay, so uh, Jenny Godby, and I'm just a concerned pet parent. Um, I'm in LA County, but I'm calling. I have ideas. Um, so we need money for staffing. We need money for expansion. We need people to be there to perform the job. So I'm aware there is a tremendous surplus in unclaimed can and bottle deposits that the state is currently sitting on, I believe, over $600 million. That is a wonderful source of money. I've read that there is uh, consideration that uh, Governor Newsom was thinking of doubling the refunds people received. Instead, if we could divert this towards shelter animals to help them and these shelters specifically with their needs, um, we could outsource dog walkers. There is a large resource of dog walking companies. We could outsource. Uh, I've seen tons of them. on. Uh, if you Google search, if you go to care.com, they have that's kind of what they do. Um, Indeed has quite a listing as well. Um, <clears throat> if we could uh, even community service, bring in community service hour people that are performing hours for their uh, time to come in and walk dogs to get them. These dogs need to get exercised, and if it's a situation of where we don't have people to do it, then we need to find a way to do that. Um, training programs to make the dogs more adoptable. If we can bring in or find anyone that is a uh, 501c rescue type that is affiliated with training to bring in trainers to provide training for these dogs so they are more adoptable, that thank, will get them out you, of the shelters. We appreciate yeah. your public okay. comment. Thank you. Thank you. Can I speak now? I'm yes. told to unmute. Yes, you can. Okay, great. Hi. Uh, Daniel, just so you know, you do have general public comments on the agenda and I'll file a Brown Act complaint if I'm not given my second minute to speak. It's on the agenda. I'm starting my clock at two minutes. Uh, for identification purposes only, I have a column out this morning on danielgus.substack.com. Daniel Gus with two S's. It's called Paul Koretz's Million Dollar Swindle, 
cruel consequences, retaliation, and a paperwork shell game. There was a million dollars in the Animal Welfare Trust Fund. I was on the John and Ken show talking about it last week. That money could have been and should have been used to hire dog walkers and bring in volunteers. You knew about this, Mr. Koretz. I warned you in November 2020 that that contract with the glue was a misappropriation of a million dollars plus. And that could have been used all this time, just a sliver of it, $50,000, $100,000. How dare you thank the whistleblowers when one of the whistleblowers who spoke to KTLA was suspended. This is your fault, and if you want to fix this thing today, take out $100,000 from your campaign against uh, uh, Kenneth Mejia for city controller. You caused this. You fixed it. Fix it today and resign. You're not going to win the, the, the city the city control job nor you de- nor do you deserve it this was preventable this was known i encourage everybody to read my new column Dan- uh, at daniel gus with two s's dot substack dot com this is cruel and if any of us did this our animals would be seized and we would be charged with misdemeanor animal cruelty mr correct you are the mr hirsch does his one minute up Yes, it is. Uh, you have uh, can, you have it on you, the agenda. Can you, you, ha- you have can it you, on the agenda. Can you mute him, please? It's, uh, it's city attorney, agenda, you have to you allow mute him, it. Please? It's a Brown Act. It's a Brown Act violation. Can somebody, please mute him, Mr. City oh, Attorney. Um, is his time not up, or is there some reason why he should have been given an extra minute? Not to my knowledge. Uh, it was given out as. Uh, in the instructions, so he had the one minute. Thank you. All right, next speaker, please. Caller with the last four numbers, 0266. Please state your name and begin to speak. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, Diane Barron's here. I volunteered off and on at the shelter over 10, you know, over a period of 10 years, and I am so grateful that this is going on and I am so grateful that you're taking this meeting and that you that changes will be made because obviously if they're not there'll be more more screaming and shouting from all of us but it's it's about time and I have only the volunteers to thank for their for their Instagram posts and their 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 you know ringing of bells and it it, it's it's heartwarming that that something's going to happen and it's heartbreaking to be so stressed, to, to be so focused on no-kill shelters when animals go crazy in the shelters and lose their minds and, and have to be euthanized because of the torturous situations they're in there. Um, so I'm just glad and I hope that the funding goes into the right places, into the appropriate places, and that, that changes will be made and that this transparency i'm just grateful for all of it it's been a long time coming and um I'm thank you glad ma'am. That, that you did this meeting okay thank you ma'am caller with the last four numbers five seven four three please state your name and give us your public comment Caller with the last four numbers, 5743. Please press star 6, state your name, and begin your comment. Okay, they must not be on anymore. Again, caller with the last four numbers, 5743. Please state your name. Okay, there you are. My name's Jill Deshay, and I'm the founder and executive director of Out of the Cage Rescue. I joined today's speakers as part of an on-the-ground effort to save dogs from L.A. shelters. Today we're hearing about inadequate staffing, the need for spay-neuter, poor living conditions for the animals, and these are necessary conversations. But our shelters need more than incremental improvements, which, as Tom mentioned, don't stick. It's time for disruptive and systemic change. Our political leaders should consider the privatization of our shelters. L.A. taxpayers need experienced outside leaders to take over the shelter system and run it like a business. 
This means redefining the mission, identifying critical initiatives, revamping compensation and reward systems, creating non-traditional coalitions with outside partners, and modernizing technologies. We need to confront the realities of the entire system. Every day we ignore the shelter's flawed foundations as a day of unnecessary euthanasia. It's time to privatize. Thank you. Thank you very much. Caller with the last four numbers, 0849. Please press star six to unmute yourself and let us know your name and begin your public comment. Previous speaker, but we have been advised uh, uh, by our city attorney that it's all part of free speech, so we we need to uh, let that happen. Um, hopefully, at some point, we'll have a different uh, strategy. So uh, our our staff and our speakers won't be subjected to uh, such testimony. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Follow with the last four numbers, 4333. Please press star six to unmute yourself and let us know your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, my name is Whitney Smith, and I'm talking about the only item on the agenda, what's going on in animal services. First of all, it's the hypocrisy for me, Paul Kretz. I've called into every PAW committee meeting. You guys have canceled half of the, all the PAW committee meetings because it's that low interest to you. Despite... The Animal Commission, who in the past two years has not produced one single report of their own on the conditions going on at the shelter. So between your failed leadership and the commission, which is supposed to be the voice of the people, we bring all of these issues for years, and they make not one report. So that's the hypocrisy that's kind of getting to me. I'd also like to refer to uh, Councilmember Kerkorian's question to Annette Ranieres at the Budget Committee which was deciding what the money that we could get for the shelter was, he asked her, what is the ratio of staff to animal? She didn't know. He asked her for a report. I'm really hoping that report's going to be made public because from my best estimation, the, re the ratio is about 12 people to 250 animals. That would be uh, six staff, six volunteers on any given day. Is that adequate? We all know it's not. This has been going on for over a decade, and... The fact that you're now accolading whistleblowers, then reinstall Claudio Cousinier, who was fired, suspended, on air while he was talking to the media. That's how scared you are of the truth. Face it. Embrace it. And actually do some systemic change because the systemic failure of LA Animal Services is well known. It's documented. And it's extremely facetious to sit here and say, oh, now we care. But, uh, thank, you, say, very, thank you very much, ma'am. Caller with the last four numbers, 8039. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Give us your name and begin your public testimony. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Okay. My name is Leslie Pierce. I'm a volunteer at the South LA Shelter. And 
um, like like many other concerned citizens have have stated, there are issues at every single level and everywhere you turn in the shelter system. From the moment I signed up to be a volunteer, which I would encourage all of you to do, sign up to be a volunteer, and then you will see from the moment that you do that where the issues start, and it permeates throughout the entire system. It needs to be changed systemically from top, top to bottom, but what I see as the most acute needs are shelter maintenance and staffing. For example, I was there yesterday. I will be back there again today, and I see numerous water bowls with black and green algae growing. That does not happen overnight. Staff appears to not be required to do this or clean this, or they don't care. They don't have time to. Um, I do it every, every chance I get. Um, another thing is the floors are covered in water, so their paws, are they slip around, they get injured. Um, any wounds that they have can become infected. I mean, this is all just very, very basic. Um, Thank you, ma'am. It, it needs to start there. Thank you. Thank you. Carla with the last four numbers, 9153. Please press star six, state your name, and begin your testimony. Caller with the last four numbers, 9153. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. Hi, Danielle Howard, South LA, Sh South LA Shelter Volunteer. I'm not sure if committee members were finally moved to provide oversight and visit the shelters over the last week, but if your only information about enrichment for the dogs is from interviews on CBS and Fox LA, you wouldn't know that at South LA Shelter alone, there are currently 130 dogs with intake dates varying from March 23rd to July 18th that have not been walked. To be fair, 58 of those are housed inside and not readily available to volunteers. 38 dogs last, last got out of their kennels in the month of June, including Coco on June 8th and Raven, whose last out was on June 10th. From July 1st to July 7th, 54 dogs like Boomer and Sweet Potato received their last out of kennel enrichment. From July 8th to July 15th, 47 dogs like Benny and Trio were able to finally get out of their kennels. And since July 16th, Shara and Sir Graham were the lucky dogs among just 36 out of 300 who finally had time out of the over 300 dogs in kennels. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Carla with the last four numbers. Nine two four one. Please press star six to unmute yourself, say your name, and begin your testimony. Uh, thank you. My name is David Anderson, and I think you got cut off. I think you got cut off. Um, we will pick him up when he calls back in. Caller with the last four numbers, 9734. Please state your name and begin your testimony. Caller with the last four numbers, 9734. Please press star six, state your name, and begin your testimony. Thank you. Uh, my name is Angela Yerenas. I'm an animal control officer assigned to North Central. I'm also a shop steward. And I think that um, the LA Times story highlighted a very small part of a bigger problem, which is staffing. We are at a very critical shortage right now. Uh, I can't even say we're keeping our head above water, but we're the staff there that are there dedicated are doing the best job that they can. We obviously need resources. We need hiring. Um, also, uh, resources should be redirected to rehabbers, uh, intervention programs, some of the rescues, and more community education. I That's one thing that I have not seen is... Um, PSA announcements on our spay neuter programs, on licensing. We need to do a better job with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Caller with the last four numbers, 1287. 
please state your name and begin your testimony. Call with the last one. Members. Oh, okay. Hi, my name is Annabelle, and I volunteer at Harbor Shelter. Uh, the LA Times was just the tip of the iceberg. LAS is drowning in problems, and the animals in their care suffer. The COVID policy needs to be addressed now. One employee got COVID on the day shift recently at Harbor, and the entire shift is told to go home even though all are wearing masks. No testing. They can stay home for 10 days with pay. If they want to come back after five days, they can get tested. But why go back to work when you are paid not to? I work at a hospital, and after exposure, as long as we have no symptoms and a negative test, we can resume work. We have staff working double shifts now, and recently a graveyard ACT tested positive, and the other staff member was sent home. He was sent all day shift and graveyard staff at Harbor away for 10 days. Most will never be positive. This really needs to be addressed and is a big source of staff shortage. Um, volunteers to be a huge asset for LAS because they are free and willing to help, especially when LAS is short staffed. Yesterday, volunteers cleaned kennels, filled water bowls um, because we were so short staffed. One part-time clerk handles all six LAS volunteer applications, and many will never and many people complain they never uh, get responses. Um, I'm on the Facebook and Instagram, and a lot of people reach out um, saying that they're not getting responses, and this is before the LA Times article. Um, volunteers at Harbor have to constantly check dog kennels that have water bowls because they're, they're not filled up, and the, the dogs don't have any water, and this is a routine thing, and the volunteers are always having to check, and that's kind thank, of Thank you very thing. much, ma'am. Thank you very much. Okay. Caller with the last four numbers, 9241. Please state your name and begin your testimony. Caller with the last four numbers, 9241. Please press star six, state your name, and begin your testimony. Okay, they must not be back. Caller with the last four numbers, 6923. Please press star six, unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. Hello? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Um, my name is Susan Barron. I'm a volunteer at West Valley Animal Shelter. And since the LA Times article was published last week, many volunteer voices have been heard in the article itself in follow-up letters to the editor and on social media. But two valuable and dedicated volunteers at West Valley, Claudio and Jean, who voiced shelter concerns to KTLA, were immediately suspended. The official reason, because they were wearing volunteer shirts during the interview. Over the years, volunteers have approached supervisors to share concerns over unprofessional behavior by shelter employees. These complaints almost never result in discipline to the staff member. They often end with the volunteer being suspended or terminated. As volunteers at the LA Animal Shelters, we are there for one reason, to make life better for the animals during their stay. If we see something alarming, we should be able to address the issue without fear of reprisal. For myself, I feel less welcome and less like a full member of the team. I beg you to do the right thing for the animals and for the betterment of the shelter. Claudio and Jean should be reinstated immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much. Caller with the last four numbers, 1548. Please state your name and begin your testimony. Good morning. My name is Kat Lasky, and I've been a volunteer at LA Animal Services for the past five years. And I've found a system so deeply broken that I feel our only hope is privatization. I've found inhumane conditions in the small animal rooms of every one of our shelters. Apathetic, untrained, unaccountable staff. Empty water bottles and days without food. There is starvation and breeding happening with our shelter's walls. 
reliance on volunteers for basic care, and if volunteers don't show up that day, the animals often don't get fed. Inadequate spay-neuter services, not addressing the root of our pet overpopulation, but barely putting out fires. And this has been going on long before COVID. Dysfunctional and inhumane for too long at the expense of our animals' well-being, it is time to disband LA Animal Services and privatize our city's animal welfare system once and for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, caller with the last four numbers, 4206. Who just disappeared from my queue? Last uh, caller with the last four numbers four two zero eight. Please uh, press star six to unmute yourself. State your name. Right, and can you hear me? Testimony. Yes, we can. Uh, it's Rob Kwan. Um, in 2020, I adopted someone's pandemic puppy. They surrendered to the East Valley Shelter. Uh, they didn't have time. He had separation anxiety and barked a lot. The single most important thing for normalizing him was regular exercise. Thankfully, he only spent a week in the shelter. Uh, I called in the council twice in 2020 because I was shocked to see what kind of unworkable and overwhelming conditions staff and volunteers were left with and was surprised to hear so many of them call in as well. Uh, when I picked up my dog, they said he was doing well after being neutered but gave me a cone just in case he started licking his wound. When I got back, I realized they must not have actually been checking on his recovery because over the previous few days, unknown to staff, he had licked his skin raw and it was beginning to show the signs of infection. Uh, this was your doing through ongoing neglect and worsened by those sit by us. Um, Paul, I noticed that before going to recess, you found 250K for LAPD overtime. Maybe if the animals had a pack bankrolling IEs, you'd find a reason to secure them some money like LAPD. 45 minutes with one minute comment each is a joke and an insult. Uh, shout out to Mike Bottom for being the only one on this committee that realized those sit by us would blow up in our face. Thank you, sir. Caller with the last four numbers, 0551. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yes, this is Kathy Serksness. Um, I was a dedicated volunteer at the West Vale Animal Shelter for well over 10 years before I was unjustly terminated based on flies. I would walk dogs on a daily basis and foster kittens, which I still do. Anyway, in my opinion, this emergency meeting that you're having today is a, is a charade. To pretend like what was reported in the LA Times articles was new and shocking news is really shameful and deceitful to the public. Paul Corrett, the PAW Committee, and the commissioners have known about these issues for years and have done nothing. And I know that because I call in for every commissioner meeting. Do the commissioners not talk to the PAW committee and vice versa? Oh, you've known about these problems, poor conditions at the shelter, dogs languishing in their kennels for months at a time sometimes, the negative impact of appointment only, and the retaliation against volunteers, to name a few. You authorize the spending of $1.5 million for a consulting company. Thank you, ma'am. And you really got... Appreciate it. Caller with the last four numbers, 3282. Please press star six, state your name, and begin your testimony. Hi, this is Claudio, West Valley Animal Shelter Volunteer, or I, as I should say, suspended volunteer. Um, first, I'd like to reiterate a couple of things that people said. Tom and I have been asking for people to come and shadow us at the shelter for a long time, and nobody wants to come. I have proposed many ideas on how to get more dogs out of the shelter, Friday night engagements, Saturday morning play groups, um, dog walking events. Since the loss of Thomas, there will be no more playgroups in almost all of the shelters. Playgroups is the main way that many dogs can get out at the same time, so it really needs to be reactivated. I'm one of the only people skilled to do playgroups, and I have been suspended. With me out of the West Valley shelter, a dog named Ace will never get out. A dog named Texan will never get out. 
a dog named Odin will never get out, a dog named Buddha will never get out, a dog named Bruno will never get out. So if you're worried about dogs staying in the shelter and staying in their kennels, then you need to reactivate me immediately. I have a First Amendment right to speak to the press, okay? I was giving a false excuse via email of why I was suspended, okay? And one of the reasons they put where I was suspended is because I wasn't wearing a mask, okay, in an email. And I have Thank you, email. sir. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Call with the last four numbers, 7443. Please press star six to unmute yourself. State your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Carol Shokrin. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, I would suggest um, doing a pilot program, fully opening the shelters. Uh, everything I'm going to say here are just suggestions of how to do things a little bit differently. So fully open, for example, Monday through Wednesday, 10 to 5. There's no reason to open at 8 o'clock in the morning. Thursday and Friday, 12 to 7. Saturday and Sunday, 10 to 5. Process all volunteer requests now. I didn't really believe that all the volunteer requests weren't being answered, so I put one in myself two months ago. It hasn't been responded to. People that could easily fit into the program are being turned down or not being answered. Um, also, fix the phone so that they actually work and people can call in. Three, a volunteer opportunity could go out to corporations. Corporations are looking to do these kinds of things, and you could get mass dog walking all at one time from somebody perhaps like homeboy or homegirl to like fill in some of the slots right now to do part-time or full-time work. Thank you, ma'am, for your time. Oh, oopsie daisy. Too long. Oh, sorry. Call them with the last four numbers, 8020. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your public comment. Hi, this is Paul DeRigo with Tula Citizens for Humane Los Angeles. I, I have a uh, point of order. The, the commission, uh, Paul's committee, have you designated only one minute or two minutes for public comment? It's, uh, it's only one minute, and uh, for special meetings, there ne there's never a general public comment. Copy that. Thank you. Okay, so I would like to say that I feel like whatever I say today will fall on deaf ears. We've had copious suggestions. What we're missing is effectuating those suggestions into worthy policies, into worthy actions. The LA Commission, Animal Commission, does no reports, has no involvement, doesn't visit the shelters. My request is they be replaced. Uh, El Chula will then be creating a LA Animal Committee where we will meet uh, regularly to discuss animal issues. Of course, reinstate Claudio and Jean. They have a First Amendment right. The case has already been adjudicated. I'm asking the pause committee to do what you need to do to mitigate, facilitate city council and mayor to hire and add staff immediately, to listen to the people, to act and be accountable, and to document the processes that you're working on so people can be informed. I wish I could say more, and I wish there was more to say. You guys know what people are saying. You've heard it all before. So it's time now to put it in action, and let's get things done. It's not rocket science. We can do it, but we need you to help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Caller with the last four numbers, 7784. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your public comment. Hi, my name is Lindsay, and I volunteer for a number of Southern California rescues. I'm going to provide um, our perspective. First off, pull rights applications to the city shelters are taking too long to go through the county, and the application process is lengthy and demanding. Um, for example, the DACC adoption partner application requires two vet recommendations, and the vets are overworked. They don't have time to write recommendation letters. Rescues are overworked and overwhelmed, and two partners are needed to submit that to get approval. 
Um, all other county shelters require simple applications, and applicants are approved in a timely manner. Rescues are waiting months while dogs are dying in the shelters, with the only option is adopt to rescue from the public. Not good. And rescues are also receiving, um, we want to know if they're receiving pleas on dogs during 72 hours. Apparently, there's a new regime that's sticking to the 72 hours and dogs are getting killed. I think that we don't murder inmates on death row. However, we are euthanizing innocent dogs for the only crime of not being loved enough. It is a direct moral reflection of our society. I mirror the last lady who said we need to privatize our shelters. We do need to run these like a business to save these dogs. Thank I'd you, ma'am. Quote- Appreciate your time. Call her with the last four numbers. 6406, please press star 6 to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your comment. Uh, Mr. Koretz and uh, and members of this group, my name is Charles Leone, and I have the honor and privilege of representing, working for SCIU Local 721, uh, and being part of the Coalition of LACD Unions, and we represent the ACTs and the ACOs, and it's good to be with you this morning for these public comments. Uh, looking at the newspaper articles, and we realized that the problems that we're talking about, the challenges that we faced didn't happen overnight, didn't come up overnight, and we're not going to be able to solve it overnight. A lot of the problems when it comes to overcrowding has been around for a very long time, and I echo the comment that was made by our union steward earlier this morning that the overcrowding is a microcosm of the real issue when it comes to staffing. Now, I understand that there are some folks that have called in and they got their own political agenda and they want to vilify employees, they want to vilify the city, they want to vilify corrects, they want to vilify animal services. And those folks that want to use this opportunity to address the serious problem with the overcrowding in our shelters for some uh, political agenda or some venomous thought that somehow taking the reins of animal services into the hands of a private operator is going to fill the, fulfill, uh, the, uh, fill the problem running it like a business, uh, let's, not, let's not forget that if it was a private business and if the city of Los Angeles were to go in that direction, these nonprofits and these private operate, operators of these shelters would not be obligated to take in every single animal that shows up at the door. We do in animal services. Every single animal that shows up at the door, the ACTs and the ACOs and the folks in animal services take them in regardless if they're adoptable or not. But you Thank you, sir, for your time. Operator. We hope you fulfill the problem and increase staff. Increase staff. Thank you. Caller with the last four numbers, 5959. Five, nine. Actually, they are not on the queue anymore. Caller with the last four numbers, 7336. Please press star 6. State your name and begin your public testimony. Yes, hello. My name is Courtney Mann. I've been a rescuer networker uh, in L.A. for about 10 years now. And uh, this needs a complete organizational overhaul. You need to clean house, run it like a business, and quit claiming victimhood because it's been run into the ground by incompetence and excuses. You've got a $25 million budget to work with. Overcrowding and walking shouldn't be an issue with a budget like that. We need staffers who actually care uh, to walk the dogs and attend to any medical issues as soon as possible for both cats and dogs. The star funds are there to be used. Why aren't they being accessed more? We keep hearing about cases where the animal was left to suffer with no medical care. So who's accessing that money? Is it Perez? Is it Dana Brown? Who, who's, who's getting that money? Because they're not receiving the help. There's no excuse to not take the dogs out of cages daily and have fresh food and water. They, the shelter should be open six days a week. Take the VAX requirement off visits so more animals can be adopted. There's no VAX required to enter a pet store. There shouldn't be one for a shelter. Get a TNR program going, charge backyard breeders, and more money for purebreds that come in for adoption. Stop telling citizens to put the animal back on the street. It's ridiculous. Thank, thank you, ma'am. The shelter is there. Appreciate your shelter, time. Thank you. Call the with the last four numbers, 0787. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. I'm Jeff Mausner, a volunteer at the West Valley Shelter. I'm also involved with the neighborhood councils, but speaking in an individual capacity.
capacity. I agree with most of the previous speakers. These matters have been brought up many times at Board of Animal Services Commissioner's meetings. The commissioners and department officials have to listen to what the volunteers and these activists are saying and fix it. It's true that there isn't enough money for the Animal Services Department in the city budget, but the commissioners and department officials have to ask for it and fight for more money in city council, not just accept what they are given. Lastly, and very importantly, the volunteers who have been suspended or terminated for exercising their First Amendment rights have to be reinstated. This hearing wouldn't be taking place today if those volunteers hadn't spoken to the press. The animals need those volunteers. Everyone knows that there's a volunteer shortage. Reinstate those volunteers. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your time. You. Caller with the last four numbers, 5455. Five. Please state your name. Actually, please press star six. Unmute yourself. State your name and begin your testimony. Hi, my name is Victoria Harrison. I work at the West Valley Animal Shelter. I'm the in-charge clerk. I'm just gonna go over a couple quick things. First of all, our staff is working extremely hard, very, very hard on a daily basis. We are there 100% with the animal's um, best interest, but we don't have the people. There are some days when we only have two ACTs on the floor, and it's very complicated for them to be able to take care of all of the animals and assist the public at the same time. We have our upper management who knows everything that's going on but doesn't care. They have people in unqualified positions getting six figures who shouldn't even be where they are currently at. Um, the low staff is contributing to poor public assistance and animal care um, in general. Our basic shelter functions cannot be done on a daily basis. And not all, but we do have quite a few volunteers who are working against the staff creating problems. And the reason that the volunteer was sent home and, and uh, I'm sorry, was um, suspended is he did not have permission to speak to the media. Thank you, ma'am. So appreciate that's basically. your time. Thank you. Carla with the last four numbers, 5484. Four. Please state your name. Press star six to unmute yourself. Please state your name and begin your testimony. Hello? Yes. My name is Jan Bunker. I'm a volunteer at Harbor Shelter. And, um, of course, I want to mention that more staff needs to be added. But also, at least at our shelter, we need a new system. Some staff work hard, but there are too many others who don't do their jobs and are not held accountable. I have personally been treated with disrespect, as have other volunteers and members of the public. People are routinely not thanked for their donations, and when they call in, the phone rings forever. I met three potential volunteers who were treated so poorly in their initial meeting, they never came back. I've seen people who have brought in huge donations of supplies that are coldly told to put it over there and not even thanked. We need money for supplies for dogs, yes, but also for the small mammals, which is a pathetic situation. We need more committed staff members, and we need a campaign to engage respectfully with our surrounding public. Also, please reinstate the two volunteers recently suspended. It's violating their First Amendment rights, and it's threatening to all volunteers. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate your time. Caller with the last four numbers, 7716. Please state your, uh, please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. Hi, my name is Nikki Lotsabadi. Um, I've just been going to visiting shelters for the past couple um, weeks, and I have a few points I want to mention. Um, there really needs to just be increased funding for shelters in L.A. County. There's, um, I want to emphasize a lack of funding for the San Gabriel Valley Shelter. The shelter infrastructure is aging. It's poorly designed. There's a lack of space. The objects work together. The plastic infrastructure is echoing, bark, uh, so the barking is making the shelter frightening for animals inside and for visitors. 
um, there really needs to be evening hours available to the public for adoptions and so volunteers can come after the workday during the week. There needs to be more paid shelter employees, so there is consistent assistance at shelters. There needs to be a stronger publicity program for the shelters um, that they're working hard to eliminate the animal overpopulation crisis, et cetera. There needs to be citywide awareness Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate your time. Day. Thank you. Caller with the last four numbers, 3583. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. Hi, my name is Joey Tuccio with Animal Rescue Mission. Um, first off, volunteers, you're doing an amazing job. Um, among the rescue community, most of us, unfortunately, consider animal control a lost cause and, frankly, a joke. And we very often have to take matters into our own hands. It could take days for animal control to show up to an incident, if they show up at all, um, and they have to follow through. Recently, a man was beating and choking his small pug and caught on camera. And after calling AC multiple times, um, officials showed up only to leave shortly after because the owners were getting, quote-unquote, angry. After the video went viral and multiple witnesses came forward, the man was arrested, released with just a misdemeanor and no bail. The dog is in evidence, and, after, and a rescuer had to keep emailing Animal Control to get first rights to get the dog. And finally, Animal Control wrote back saying the owner could get the dog back, and he had no record of the video. If the rescuer didn't stay on top of it, animal control would have returned the owner, would have returned the dog to the abuser. Um, we, we need more staffing with animal control, and it has to start now. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your time. Caller with the last four numbers, 8967. Please press star six to unmute yourself. It's not Edward, can you? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. This emergency meeting is years late. You've all known all of this. I've visited South LA Shelter 97 times for videos over three years and spoken often at commission meetings. Why won't you listen to us? Almost every dog in our South LA Shelter unfixed. Our mandatory spay and neuter law is useless without messaging and enforcement. Where's the outreach and more accessible free and cheap services? Adopting out unfixed dogs and cats at South LA with no follow-up only adds to the overpopulation crisis. Two to four million homeless cats in LA, boxes of kittens dumped daily. Mom left to get pregnant again? Where's the education, the TNR support, the Promise Community Cat Program? Shameful. The reality, we can't adopt or rescue our way out. It's time to get serious about controlling the population and decreasing intakes to save lives and money. With community outreach, more spay and neuter services and enforcement, reducing breeders' licenses sold, shut down illegal breeders, a real cat program with TNR services, no more driving hours to get cats and traps fixed. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Caller with the last four numbers, 4380. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. Yes, uh, Jackie Navratil, and I would greatly urge uh, the city to please address the root of this problem um, and make every attempt to mitigate the number of dogs, cats, rabbits, animals entering our shelters through an aggressive spay-neuter program. Um, it's very difficult for the public to access services, and I think that this is really the root of the problem. We need to, to mitigate the number of animals that need to enter the shelter, and that are breeding all over the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Carla, with the last four numbers, 3929, please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. Hi, my name is Ashley Olson. And with all due respect, in order for this committee and commission to be effective, you guys need to be educated on the nuances and the reality of the shelter system, which is required to oversee such complex matters that demand a rich understanding of animal behavior, the shelter system, and the complexities contributing to a homeless pet population. The shelters run on little funding, resources, and a staff so lean that animal control officers operate with the same learned helplessness that the dogs in the shelters do. Meanwhile, animal welfare has never been a priority to leaders in government. 
We need to bring in outside experts and academics who study shelter environments and how it impacts the animals. There are experts that have dedicated their life to studying animal shelters within veterinary institutions. Community outreach and education is also crucial to getting to the root of the problem. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Paula with the last four numbers, nine, um, 9890. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and start your testimony. Hi, everyone. My name is Gwen Zambrano, and I am calling to address this horrible issue. It is devastating because growing up, I was always raised with the moral compass of help those with, that have no voice, stand up for what is right. And um, I, it's just devastating. You know what needs to be done. And I put my faith, put, we're putting our faith, we're putting our trust in you today to make a difference, to use the funds for these animals. They need to be taken care of. Please, it is frustrating. You could hear it in everyone's voice. We're all trying to make a difference. We're all willing to volunteer. We're all willing to be part of the solution. We need you. We need you, the people that empower, to do that for us. There are many things that could be done, but let's just start off with the basic humane um, benefits for these animals, which are food, clean water, and a clean space to live in. You guys, please hear me today. Please hear all of us today. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Caller with the last four numbers, 4411. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. Hello? Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Carolyn Ilya. I was a dog walker, volunteer at West Valley Animal Service at West Valley Shelter. I was terminated when I reported abusive environment. Los Angeles Services went as far as drafting an apology letter to me, but instead Ms. Ramirez opted to just go ahead and suspend me. I understand two new volunteers got suspended now, but please note, this is nothing new. We have carefully and over the years documented systemic abuse and unfair termination, <clears throat> and you've ignored them. Mr. Koretz, this is nothing new to you. We have let you know over and over and over in emails, in meetings, commissioners, and PAW meetings, you and your staff have gone as far as Mr. Brickhart and your staff, I specify, have gone as far as calling us malcontents. But now, all of a sudden, now that LA Times has exposed you, you put on this charade of a political charade meeting, you've known. What have you done? Nothing. What are you planning to do now? Thank you, ma'am. Follow with the last four numbers, 9423. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Catherine Koo, a former volunteer at the South LA and the West LA shelter who is unjustly terminated. First off, I would like to say that everyone in this meeting knew what was going on at the shelter. As many emails were sent to you guys, but you guys chose to ignore it and turn a blind night. Now it has been exposed in LA Times, you are surprised in holding this quote, unquote, emergency meeting. The excuse of short staff is not going to cut it. Whatever staff you do have employed are not seen while they are working their shifts. If you are indeed short staff, then stop terminating volunteers who are de dedicated and have had success in getting the animals out at the shelter out, either by rescue or adoption, only because they spoke up about the shelter con conditions. It is time to reinstate terminated volunteers. It's time to open up the shelters to the public with pre-COVID hours and do away with appointments. Stop selling breeder licenses, enforce spay and neuter, use the animal welfare trust fund for animals and not for other irrelevant and outrageous expenses. Staff are not held responsible for their actions. Their volcanoes are not being cleaned. Animals are not provided clean water. Thank you, ma'am. They get either green water or no time. water. Thank you very much. Call them with we, the last... We uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Hirsch. Uh, I, I know we have many other callers, and at some point we have to get on with the hearing. Uh, we're, we're far beyond the amount of time we allocated. So we're going to do another 15 minutes. I apologize to 
anyone that uh, hasn't been heard, but even that uh, at one minute we're running uh, we're running very long. So we'll take another fifteen minutes and then we'll uh, we'll begin the hearing. Caller with the last four numbers, 4423, please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. Hello, my name is Bianca. I'm a rescuer, a colony feeder, and a trapper. I'm out on the street 15 hours a week, and what I see is a disaster. The new policies of leaving stray cats and kittens alone on the street is not only wrong, it is fueling the huge feral cat problem and you are teaching it is okay to abandon cats to the streets. Please go back to the core values of educating the public and community outreach is needed about the necessity of spay and neuter. You are silent, providing low-cost free spay and neuter services so that spay and neuter of pets actually happens. Provide TNR help to the public. There are mega colonies happening everywhere. Never adopt out an unfixed animal. You have one chance, one chance to make sure that animal does not grow up to reproduce. Once it leaves the building, it's over. People get busy, they forget, and they move. And um, put a moratorium on breeder's licenses. This, this is, and, and shut down illegal breeding. This is ridiculous. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. We appreciate your time. Paula, with the last four numbers, three, four, six, seven. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. Yes, hi. My name is Sharon Tidell, and I just want to point out the importance of even the small mammals. They're just as important as the dogs and cats, and the hamsters, they'll... All, they'll go all night without having any food or water. There doesn't seem to be any oversight or anybody responsible to check on them. And that's just atrocious. I mean, nobody wants to go without food and water. You know, that's not fair. It's not fair to them. It's not healthy. And also, um, bonded rabbits are still getting separated, and that's actually cruel to the rabbits. They bond for life. And when they come into the shelter as a bonded pair and then you would separate them and adopt them out, that's cruel to the rabbits. So there should be some oversight on this. There should be, a, you know, responsible managers and supervisors and general managers to, to have oversight over all the activities that are going on at the shelters. Thank and you, ma'am. We appreciate your time. Caller with the last four numbers, 1250, please press star 6 to unmute yourself, state your name, and give us your testimony. Hello, my name is Marcy Creighton. I'm a volunteer at Harbor. Um, I would like to agree with everything that Annabelle said um, and Jan. I think that we definitely need more staff and volunteers, but the bureaucracy is very clearly not working at getting people in. Um, they said they were hiring months ago. They aren't processing volunteers. Um, so maybe it does need to be privatized or, or handled like a business. Also, you've known all these problems for years. They, we need to educate the public. Setting a 90% no kill rate and advertising that then makes it easy for people to just, oh, I don't want this dog anymore. I'm going to drop them off. Oh, it's too much trouble. People need to have ways to rehome their animals. We need to look at um, enforcing spay and neuter, getting rid of the extra breeders, and supervising the staff that are working. Some work really, really hard, and others sit and play on their phones. And there is no distinguishment. Um, and I think the union doesn't help that. I dislike the union rep speaking. Um, thank you very much, anyway, Pamela. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Caller with the last four numbers, 4162. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. Caller with the last four numbers, 4162. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state Hello. your name. Okay, thank you. Go on. Sorry about that. Hi, my name is Teresa Sanford. Um, I'm a teacher with LA Unified School District. 
And I was a volunteer way back in the day at Harbor from about 95 to 2005, 2006. Um, and I participated in MPA, Mobile Pet Adoption Events. Um, I drove the truck. I volunteered countless, countless hours. Um, so I would recommend bringing back perhaps some of these mobile adoption events as a way to get um, publicity out and maybe a source of volunteers. Um, I agree with one of the previous speakers, well, several, who said, you know, you need to hire more staff. Um, I looked, I searched animal on the city website for the, on the jobs site, and there's only three positions um, that are, that have an, it looks like an opening right now, a vet tech, an animal control officer, and an animal keeper for the zoo. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate your time. Carla with the last four digits, 3888. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Kennedy, and I'm a foster um, with one of the local rescues. And the comment that I wanted to make has already been made several times, but I think it's worth uh, reinforcing. We can talk about revising and revamping the shelters, but really we're just playing a big game of whack-a-mole until we really address the issue, which is the overpopulation. So I think a lot of the funding really needs to be focused on, like other people said, spay and neuter, um, and also really enforcing the laws that we already have on the books. Like we have the laws to really um, mitigate this problem, but we aren't. Um, and so I just, I think that our focus really needs to be put there. This is an issue that if we did something about it, we could see results in six months. I mean, this problem could completely not be existing on the level that it does next year um, if we were to do something now. Thank you. That's all. Thank you very much. Paula with the last four numbers, 6799. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Brian Gillis. Uh, I'm a volunteer at West Valley. Um, I have to address the comment uh, that Victoria made about the volunteers working against the staff. Um, this is uh, insulting. That was an insulting comment. Quite frankly, it's completely wrong. Um, we support the staff. We go above and beyond what we should be doing. Um, and most of the complaints I receive um, are regarding uh, staff behavior, and it's mostly the clerical department. So um, uh, also a reminder that the shelter system would collapse without volunteers. Um, I also want to um, say that um, core volunteers, Claudio and Jean, should be reinstated for um, you guys stated that they were brave for stepping forward. They're being retaliated against for uh, bringing these issues to the forefront. And as Claudio said, there are dogs that will not get out. They will be in their kennels until Claudio returns. Uh, there's no staff members that will take them out. Um, and Claudio is a core volunteer. He, um, he is there five days a week. Um, he has uh, connections to uh, rescues. Um, he transports animals. He does, um, he has um, dog groups where we see if dogs are dog friendly, which is an important question that always comes up with the doctors. Um, so um, we need to uh, we need to fix these problems. Reinstate Claudio and Jean immediately. We need them. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your time. Carla, with the last four numbers six six nine six, please press star six to unmute yourself. State your name and begin your testimony. Call with the last four numbers, 6696. Do you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, do you hear me? Yes, hi. Yes. My name is Jane Velez Mitchell, and I run Unchained TV, which is an animal rights streaming network. I've been listening to this. I've heard it all before because I've gone to these hearings prior to COVID, um, LA Animal Services hearings. Look, 
This is uh, an embarrassment to the city of L.A. Let's be real. Let's hope we hit bottom. And this is not just yet another hearing. Uh, all of these solutions are contained in a transcript of this hearing. We all know what they are. I am calling on the Los Angeles City Council to issue a public list of immediate changes to be implemented. Not another hearing. Not another, as Greta Thunberg would say, blah, blah, blah. We all know the answers. Okay? More money. Uh, more staff. Encourage the volunteers. My gosh, it doesn't cost that much more, does it, to extend evening hours so people who have jobs can volunteer? I mean, the answers are very clear. But what happens is just one more hearing, one more hearing. Congratulations, L.A. Times, for forcing this. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate your time. Caller with the last four numbers, 5673. Please press star six to unmute yourself. State your name and begin your testimony. My name is Alex Tonner. I am the founder of Cause for Life Canine Rescue. We operate out of the Northeast Shelter. We offer free public training for anyone who owns a dog within the city. Um, this program is highly successful. We've serviced 1,600 animals since we started this program in October. I suggest that the city goes outside and brings outside groups into the shelters, such as Dog Playing for Life, which can actually get 300 dogs out a day. It's a proven data-based organization. They've been in, and I feel like if they came in again and they implemented their programs in each of the shelters, the dogs would receive the enrichment that they need. We just have to look at LA County's program. They've got one more shelter than us. And they run these groups every single day in their shelters, and all of their shelters. They have two staff members dedicated to running these groups, and they're highly successful. People get a lot of information on the dog as they want to adopt. It gives them all the details that people need about the animals that they're adopting. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Carla with the last four numbers. Four six five zero. Please press star six to unmute yourself. State your name and begin your testimony. Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes. Hi, yes. my name is Paula Shan, and I volunteer at the West Valley Shelter for eleven years. I'm going to begin my comment by quoting Councilmember Corrett. He said, "I meet with Animal Services Department Management every month and discuss every aspect of the department's operations, including complaints." I received from members of the public about problems. So i like to know, where was the call meeting when Animal Services sent out a press release about the shelter being over capacity? For years, you received complaints about substandard care of animals and Animal Services and Company Management. And, and where was the meeting when you were repeatedly informed about dogs languishing in kennels for months without ever getting locked or when volunteers were retali retaliated against and were wrongfully terminated? Well, there were no such meetings because you didn't care. You're pretending to care now because you were called out by L.A. Times. Your only concern is about your own political aspiration. Make no mistake, the public sees through your pretense, and they know that this is nothing. The so-called emergency meeting is nothing but a public, a political performance. Lastly, reinstate the volunteers and investigate the cost termination. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate your time. Call out the last four numbers, 5605. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and start your testimony. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, this is Kiernan. I want to ask how many people are left in the queue. There are approximately over 100 people left in the queue. Can, can I get an exact number instead of over 100? Are there 300, 400? There are exactly 147 people left in the queue. 147 people. Okay. And we are not supposed to respond to your public comment. Okay, well, I thank you for that. So a lot of people have been cut off, but I think the main themes and takeaways from this meeting have been that people have known about this for years, and genuinely, 
I think it's frustrating to hear people call for change time and time again and to not be answered and to be cut off and to not get a voice. I want to ask the council to not call this an emergency meeting when they already knew these problems existed and have been doing everything in their power to avoid interacting with them and avoid changing them. Volunteers face retaliation, volunteers are suspended, and everyone calls for understaffing. The problems that exist aren't a lack of funds or a lack of staff. The staff are being retaliated against. Solving the mismanagement of LAAS will solve the problems within it. And I urge the council to look towards the comments today for solutions because they've been there this entire time. Thank you. I yield the rest of my time. And just for the record, uh, we have to be fair and try to give everybody the exact same amount of time. So we apologize for cutting people off, but everybody has one minute. And uh, obviously with uh, 147 speakers to go, even with the one minute, uh, this meeting is going much longer than uh, originally scheduled for. And it is 11.23 right now, Mr. Chair. And at what point will we have uh, used up the extra 15 minutes? I believe at 1120, um, I'm sorry, it's 1121 at 1122. All right, let's 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 allow three more speakers and then, uh, then we'll go on to the hearing. Caller with the last four numbers, 8858. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name and begin your comments. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, I'll be quick because I can't believe I hung on. Okay, this is, uh, my name is Nancy Udeback. I'm a volunteer with Harbor Shelter in San Pedro, and I think these calls have been tremendous, tremendous. And you know, the cat's out of the bag, took a long time, but this is where we are. No sense, we're not vilifying anybody. We all want, we, we gotta get shit done now. This is where we gotta go forward, so. I think it was a mistake to let Claudio and Jean go, get them back on board. And also, I have an issue with, um, I don't know this Agnes, uh, this spokesperson, but it really bothers me, like, the cat's out of the bag. We know there's not enough staff. The staff that works, they work hard. Some do, some don't. Some volunteers are good, some aren't. Come on, we're all individuals. But in this article from Dakota Smith, the second article, saying that all the dogs get daily enrichment, we cannot say these I would like to say lies because the poop isn't even getting picked up. We're not going to blow bubbles in their faces or, or give them a, a, a Kong when thank we you, can't sir. even do the rest. So let's not Th try Thank to you, ma'am. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Call with the last four numbers, 1403. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your comments. Yes, Mr. Spindler, sir. Yes, I have not spoken, son of a bitch, but He's spoken several times already. Please go on to the next speaker. Caller with the last four numbers, 0778. Please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your comments. Hi there. My name is Alicia. I'm a volunteer at South LA. Um, going to what Nancy just said a second ago, I think that my biggest comment has to do with the fact that the LA Animal Services, um, LA Animal Services um, representative, Agnes, told the media that dogs receive daily enrichment even if that means they're in their kennels. This is false, and I feel like if we're going to cover up some of these issues, this problem will never get solved. So it's time to start just being honest with the public. They do not get enrichment on a daily basis. We cannot give them toys in their kennels because they are choking hazard and they also clog the drains in the kennels. And there's not enough staff to do enrichment for 300 dogs uh, every single day. So these are the issues that need to be fixed. Um, and I, I really hope that I do see some sort of change in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And the last caller, uh, caller with the last four digits, 2230, please press star six to unmute yourself, state your name, and begin your testimony. My name is Jean Sarshady. I'm a volunteer at the West Valley 
animal shelter, and I was one of the volunteers who was suspended along with Claudio. Um, I think suspending is much more drastic than just giving us a warning. It won't do us any good to suspend us, but the dogs are not going to go walk. And they said Claudio is one of the few who walks the large dogs, and now they're going to sit in their kennels for weeks, months on end. You should see how these dogs fight not to go back in their kennels. Every time you walk by, they're screaming like crazy to get out, and it's really a shame. Um, what we did to be suspended was not anything violent. It was a minor infraction, and instead of just giving us a warning, they're actually going to suspend us, which is just crazy. I mean, what that means is people feel good sitting there knowing that we're suspended and they taught us a lesson, and these dogs are the ones going to be the ones who are suffering. They're not getting out. They're not getting any attention. Um, also, we do need more hours to get people to volunteer later in the day. And also, it's a shame that I see a lot of times they're asking for private vets for these dogs who have medical needs and they're not getting their attention because the vets there cannot handle the problems that they have. And we Thank need you more very much, like ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that is it, sir. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to ask that we take a five-minute break and that we then uh, resume with the, with the general manager. Um, and bring everybody back uh, on screen. Um, well, that was pretty dramatic testimony. And uh, we really haven't heard anything like that before in this committee. We've had some of the same people um, make a stray charge here and there. The difficulty is that then we have to seek comment from the experts, which are our department. And we often hear uh, a very different point of view. And it's very difficult for us to determine what the real truth is sometimes. Uh, you may have testi testified many times at the commission. We don't monitor the commission. We hold our own hearings. And so uh, we obviously missed a lot of concerns that have probably been, uh, been articulated there. But we have only one purpose, and I have only one purpose in doing this. I have four months left as chair of this committee. And clearly the problems are worse than I think we realized in total. I thank the LA Times for help bringing that to the fore. And as opposed to hearing a stray complaint here and there, we heard from many volunteers um, and many rescues and folks that are involved. And clearly it's not just one or two people crying out in the wilderness. Uh, there are obviously uh, hundreds more that were available um, and uh, we heard from over 50 people, and the problems are serious and many, and we need to take some dramatic steps towards addressing them. Um, I'll ask that we begin with uh, an introductory statement from the general manager, and uh, I'll ask some questions as follow-ups. Uh, most of them will be directed to animal services, but we welcome any follow-up comments from other panelists. And the same applies when a question isn't addressed to the department. You know, your, the department is obviously welcome to, uh, to answer as well. So let's begin with our, our general manager, Annette Ramirez. Thank you, Councilman Kretz. I'm here joined with members of my team, my assistant general manager, Chris Watts, as well as Jennifer Curiel, who's the Director of Field Operations over Shelter Operations, as well as Sharon Lee. And we are happy to have this opportunity to discuss the article and some of the shortcomings in our department. I think that we definitely have a lot of areas for improvement. 
Um, and I think that with additional resources and support from the city, we can do better. There's um, always room to do better. And I think we have a lot of very hardworking staff and a lot of dedicated volunteers that we could not function without. So we do value their opinions. We do value what they bring to the table because we could not function without them. Um, you know, and I'm hoping that with this meeting, we'll be able to come to some, some resolutions and find some solutions for some of the challenges that we're facing. But um, I, do, I do agree that there is room for improvement, and I'm hoping that we will be able to come to some understandings of where we can find immediate improvement and what are more longer gains um, for the long term. Well, let's, let's start with our, our shortfall in terms of staffing. So the LA Times reported that the department has 300 filled positions and 55 vacancies. How many of those vacancies are you budgeted to fill and how many are in the process of being filled? So not including 10 new positions that we received as part of this fiscal year, we currently have 51 vacancies. Uh, we have made 13 conditional job offers and 39 uh, positions are in the process of being filled through the certification process, emergency appointment, or citywide transfer. The department is required to or expected to maintain a 5% salary savings, which is equivalent to $1.19 million that we need to keep of uh, positions vacant. And how many positions would that be that are being kept vacant then? Um, it, it, it's not based on how many positions um, because we can move that around depending on the salary for the different positions. So it, as long as we just maintain the 5%. So just to get a rough idea, what are we talking about? Curtis, do we have a, a rough idea of what the 5% would be in equivalent in positions? Yes, yeah, Sharon has done some calculations. Sharon, are you able to share what those positions are equivalent to, what that amount is equivalent to in positions? Uh, hi, yes, Sharon Lee with the Department of Animal Services. The 1.9 million could be an equivalent of, uh, it could be about approximately 20 ACTs or 20 uh, administrative clerks. Um, these amounts could vary depending on um, on any other positions that we uh, that the department leaves open. Because if um, if there are any positions that are um, that do have a higher salary, um, then we could hold those vacant in order to be able to hire those that are of a um, that do not have as high of a salary. And what's a breakdown of the vacancies in terms of job classifications? So um, for the vacancies, we have currently 24 animal care technicians, uh, three veterinary technicians, two admin clerks, two animal care technician supervisor positions, 12 animal control officers, two animal licensed canvassers, two senior administrative clerks, two veterinary and two positions, and two senior animal control officer one and two positions. And how many of those vacancies are a result of the 2020 pandemic early retirement program? And which parts of your operation were hit hardest by those early retirements? So uh, positions were not actually left vacant due to the city's separation incentive plan. What was typically done is that departments lost those positions when people retired out with the program. So the departments had to request those position authorities to be added back through the budget process. During the uh, retirement incentive package, the department did lose a total of 25 positions. Uh, 10 were admin clerks, and then there were 15 other positions um, through the most recent budget cycles, the department was able to obtain an additional four vet techs, six animal care technicians, one management analyst, and seven admin clerks. And so, so what, what's the overall impact of that? I mean, how, how short did we leave ourselves and where are you feeling that specifically? Well, we did lose uh, 25 positions and we got back, I believe it's 18 of those positions in the budget cycle. Um, 
the issue is still that we already had lost, um, you know, people through attrition as well, not just through the retirement package. So there, there were other reasons that we lost positions that kind of remained vacant for a while because the city did have a hiring freeze. So we're just a little bit behind on filling the vacant positions right now as well. And so what, what can we do to uh, help you speed up that process, if anything? Well, right now, uh, like I said, we have 39 people that are currently in the process, the positions that are currently in the process of being filled. Um, they're, unfortunately, one of the, one of the like, sh challenges that we're dealing with is that all of the city departments are trying to backfill vacant positions. So there is a backlog of people getting through their medical examinations and their background and their fingerprint team. So um, I know the personnel department is working very hard to fill all the positions. And I know that they have really flagged our positions to help us fill them as quickly as we possibly can. So I think we're doing what we can to get those positions filled. Yeah, unfortunately, I think it's a combination of two departments that are historically uh, understaffed and under-resourced, uh, which you know, is certainly a bad combination. Um, what's the department's protocol for a staff testing positive for COVID? And how many currently are out and in which categories? So the we, we currently follow the personnel department's COVID-19 prevention program protocol protocols, which were updated in July. Um, right now, we, and un unfortunately, the, the change, the update did create it so that more staff are getting placed off due to potential exposures, um, which has been difficult to deal with in the recent weeks. We currently have a total of 58 staff members that are off due to COVID exposures or being positive for COVID. Uh, w which is a huge impact to our operations, that on top of the vacancies that we already have. And our current protocol is if they're exposed to stay out for 10 days? Correct. They, they are sent quarantine to quarantine for 10 days, but after five days, if they're not showing any symptoms and they have a negative test, they can return but they are not required to test. So they can use the entire 10 day period. Why are they not required to test? That's not part of the personnel department's protocol. So we're, we're following the personnel department's protocol on COVID exposures. Yeah, that's definitely something we should look at because if they could, they're only asked to voluntarily test and they're fine and they're testing fine. Um, you know, that, that may be just a waste of staff time. Obviously, we're trying to be as careful as we can, and I've certainly been an advocate for that. But um, if they could come back with voluntary testing, there's no reason why they shouldn't just have to test. And if they're testing, fine, come back. So let's take a look at that uh, as we move forward. Um, during 2020, Two of the shelters were mothballed for lack of staff. Um, if you had to fully staff each operating shelter, how many could your front, current staff levels support? So that's a challenging question as our staff numbers fluctuate daily due to the COVID exposures and people being placed off for quarantine. Um, our ability is obviously also impacted by the number of animals in our system at any given time. With our current staffing and shelter population, we could properly manage probably four shelters. Um, our current vacancy of 24 animal care technicians is enough positions to close at least one large shelter. For example, East Valley and North Central both have 20 animal care technicians uh, assigned to those facilities. Only Chesterfield Square has more at 28, but once you factor in also the 58 staff members placed off due to COVID, that has an even greater impact on our ability to operate. So I do believe that with our current staffing levels, we, we have the ability to operate four shelters. So if, if you were told you could hire another 10 staff on top of what you're already budgeted for this fiscal year, what classes do you have the most need mm -hmm. for? I, I believe the biggest need that we have 
um, for classes would be both our animal care technician as well as our administrative clerk positions. Our animal care technicians are the ones that provide the daily care, feed, and enrichment for the animals. And then the um, administrative clerks, we did get a little bit of a hit there with um, the SIP. Um, and those positions are the ones that actually process all of the adoption transactions. And any counter transactions that are done is done with them. Um, and due to lack of admin clerks, we do have long lines. And I know people do get extremely frustrated with waiting in the lines. But, you know, we're, we're making do with the, the staff that we do have. So is it only a budget question or is it also the ability to hire quickly enough? Um, the, the personnel department is actually working on certifying all the lists that we need. So we have been doing regular interviews. Um, you know, it, it, there is an onboarding process and then there's a training as well that would need to take place. So it, it would be a little while before we actually feel the relief in the shelters. But um, I think the personnel department is working very quickly with us to fill the positions. And is there anything we could do in the short term, say in the next two months, three months, four months, um, to staff up temporarily, to borrow uh, clerical staff from other departments, uh, to uh, you know, hire from consulting firms that provide clerical staffing um, and companies. Like if we could do that, could we actually staff up in some of these areas and enable um, other folks to do other duties that are, are urgently short? Uh, we, we can look into our options, but we also need to be mindful of um, them being union positions and that, um, you know, and contracting out the work of our union staff members. So um, I do think our best option is to do the hiring within the city's civil service process. But I'm talking about primarily uh, in, in the short term, whether we could uh, uh, borrow from other departments. That's probably the most realistic. Um, although, I don't, uh, again, it would have to be, I guess, the mayor that allows for such availability. Yeah, and we have made actually some of our positions um, in the admin clerk area to be lateral positions. Um, where people from other departments have the opportunity to transfer over to animal services. So it, that is one of the options that we have made available during our current hiring process. And, and maybe I'll ask Teresa for a second uh, uh, what our labor partners would think about encouraging such transfers or even loans from other departments to, to help us get through uh, the, the crisis level that we're at. Uh, thank you, council member. Obviously, ideally, it would be great if we had the opportunity to do that. However, every other department that you speak to will say that they're facing the same challenges in terms of understaffing the impact of the um, separation incentive program, which I would remind everyone was not an early retirement program. That was an incentive for folks who had the age and number of years of service to um, separate from the city to take a regular retirement to a, as a layoff avoidance strategy during the pandemic when before we knew that federal funds would be available to help um, the city weather the storm, so to speak. Um, we were facing potentially thousands of layoffs and that's why the SIP was negotiated to avoid that problem. But yes, it did leave us in a deficit citywide. Most departments will tell you they're down approximately 20% from where they were before the SIP. And that was after the hiring freeze during the recession of 2008 to 2009. So we're still, um, I would say underwater when it comes to be able to provide the services that residents expect, given the staffing that every city department has. I would say animal services is particularly suffering because of course our charge as animal services is to take care of other living beings. And that's a very special responsibility and a particularly difficult job. But I would say that as a coalition of LA city unions, we do have an immediate solution and that is targeted local hire. We have over 2000 candidates in the targeted local hire candidate pool that have been certified as ready to work 
by our work source centers and our community partners. Obviously, not everyone has the desire, the vocation, the ability to work with animals, but I would venture to guess that within that over 2,000 person candidate pool, we can find folks to become vocational workers that are training on the job to become animal care technicians within a 12 month period. They start on the job from day one, training with our staff, assisting our ACTs in the shelters to begin to help assist um, managing the workload. Um, obviously, um, we're grateful for our volunteers, but volunteers really are supplemental. They are not there to do the day in and day out work 24 seven that our animal care technicians do. Um, we also, as part of our coalition, represent the clerical administrative staff. Those positions are also part of the targeted local hire program. And we are, are completely willing to work with the department, to work with all of you, to work with the personnel department to accelerate that process, to get people on the ground in the door as quickly as possible within the next couple of weeks, if we can. And, and I'm certainly a fan of that. As, as you know, I'm one of the folks that pushed the target local hire program from the beginning. And we've certainly found that uh, even though uh, some of our general managers were skittish in the beginning of hiring people that were formerly homeless, uh, hiring people that uh, have spent some time in prison. Um, we found that, that by and large, these are, have been our best workers. Um, they've been very grateful for the jobs that they've gotten. We've even had to uh, discourage people sneaking on the job and uh, doing extra hours for free because they just want to show their gratitude. Um, so uh, anything we can do in, in that regard, uh, I, I would encourage us to use that process. Yeah, I, I would like to add on to that, that I am one of um, the general managers that is actually very supportive of the TLH program. And we actually did have a class of animal care technicians start with training um, that were pulled from the TLH program just on July 5th. So it, it is a program that we are definitely very um, supportive of. And we do agree that some of our best employees have come through that program because they are grateful to have the opportunity. And um, we do support the TLH program and are using it currently. Right, and I would I want to make sure to compliment the department. Animal Services has been one of the top departments to embrace target local hire. In some classes, they've hired 100% from target local hire, including um, animal license canvasser, and I believe animal care technician as well, and also the clerical administrative positions. Right. So in addition to the high number of animal intakes the shelters are experiencing right now, I've been hearing that the shortage of animal care technicians is central to most of the animal care issues at the shelters. Would you consider that to be true? Uh, yeah, I, I would consider the shortage of animal care technicians to be a major impact, um, but it's also along with the COVID related quarantines and positives that are having the, that major impact on our ability to provide care for the animals and meet the needs of the customers at the shelter. Animal care technicians are the staff members that are responsible for intaking animals, assisting with adoptions and fire of staff that are being placed off due to COVID. It has a major impact on our abilities as well. So, um, you know, six, six shelters, um, 30 staff members is not a huge impact, but I think it would really help us with being able to provide better service to the animals and the customers. And it's my impression and certainly from what we've heard as well that these ACTs feed the animals or are supposed to do the following things, feed the animals, clean the kennels and cages, uh, exercise and provide enrichment for the animals. Um, and all of these, at least during better times, uh, were supposed to be done. Certainly these are not so better times. And we've heard repeatedly that exercise and enrichment have been given the short shrift. Is all of that true? Yes, this is in fact true. When we had more staff and less animals, we were providing daily enrichment, which was done by the staff. Staff were running playgroups every single day. 
since our staffing levels have gone down and our animal population has gone up and we're dealing with the impacts of COVID, we've had to prioritize our staff to the basic needs of the animals, just doing the food, water, and cleaning their kennels. The industry standard is that each animal does take a minimum of 50 minutes of care each day just to clean water and feed. And that doesn't include the customer service or providing adoption counseling or assisting customers on the phone either. So um, our, our ACTs have just been really restricted in what they're able to do because of the, the lack of staff and the number of animals in the shelter. And what we've heard today and we've occasionally heard off and on for years is that even that most basic category isn't always uh, adhered to and there are times when the uh, kennels aren't kept clean uh, animals especially small animals might not get fed or watered etc um, so how do we how do we get past this we all know this shouldn't be happening uh, the conditions before COVID weren't perfect, but they're, they're certainly pretty disastrous now. Yeah, I, I think the only way we really can get past this is with additional staffing. Um, you know, I, I think that it, it was mentioned earlier that the volunteers are absolutely appreciated. They do a lot of work to help us, but they should not be the ones that we depend on to do the, the care for the animals. That is our responsibility as a city and as the Department of Animal Services. We should have sufficient staff to provide the minimum care for the animals that are in our shelters. So I, I do believe that the solution to this is to ensure that we have the proper amount of staff to provide care for the animals within the shelter and definitely continuing to work with our volunteers to provide the enhancements, the enrichment and supplement the, the job that is being done by our staff. And there's also a lot of questions uh, about how easy we make it to uh, adopt an animal. Um, and uh, I know uh, by complete coincidence, uh, I have a staffer who wanted to adopt uh, a, a reasonably large dog from the shelters. And so went to one of the animal shelters, uh, had a lot of trouble accessing anybody to get any help at all in doing so, um, and then when she started to find dogs that she liked, she was told that every one of them was unadoptable, that they were evidence dogs, or this or that, and even though she really wanted a dog, she wasn't able to find one in the whole shelter, and wasn't looking for, you know, a, a, a boutique breed or anything, just uh, you know, a, a, a friendly large dog and she couldn't adopt anything. Um, I, I think that isn't atypical. I mean, there's a, a, a lot of questions. So one of them is, is there a process to get the dogs that, that can't be adopted through whatever they're waiting for um, and out of the shelters? Uh, if they're waiting for a hearing, you know, can we hire more hearing officers? Are there, is there a process to speed that up to take some of the space? And also, you know, are there, is there a better process for our volunteers? We're hearing that uh, it's difficult to become a volunteer, um, that they're not accessed as much as they should. So they, we could be having more volunteers showing more dogs and cats, but um, it seems like there are a lot of bottlenecks and problems there. So I, I do want to point out that evidence animals are not held on our adoption floor, so I don't think that your staff are actually saw any evidence animals because they aren't on the adoption floor. They're maintained in different parts of the shelter which are not accessible to the public. Um, but we do have animals on our adoption floor which are not available for adoption because they are on their stray hold period, which is our required, you know, state mandated holding period so that an owner who's lost their pet can find, come in and claim their pet. Um, and oftentimes those are the highly adoptable dogs because they are owned or they have a microchip or they were wearing a license so they're during a holding period. Um, 
And a lot of adopters are interested in those particular animals because they are highly adoptable, but they are being held pending their owner to come claim them. I think the challenge with not finding staff on the adoption floor to provide assistance just goes back to what I've been saying this entire time is that we don't have sufficient staff to provide the care and provide the customer service that we need to provide to adopters. Um, you know, I, I think that, that there is also a challenge with onboarding volunteers because again, we don't have the staff to onboard the volunteers. We have one volunteer liaison per shelter and that volunteer liaison is supervising over a hundred volunteers and also providing training to new volunteers as they come in. We have one part-time admin clerk that actually processes the applications that volunteers have submitted and there is a great backlog on it because we do only have one part-time clerk handling that um, that role so it, it again it just all points back to the lack of staffing that we have to um, provide the infrastructure that's needed to properly manage both the volunteer program and also provide the care and the customer service so considering how much value I think we can get out of our volunteers, and we do, um, what would it take for us to actually have a well-run volunteer program in terms of staffing so that there wasn't a backlog and everybody got processed and people got trained quickly and uh, we were able to have a, a more robust and successful volunteer program? Um, to start, I think if we could be budgeted for at least one full-time admin clerk for the volunteer program, uh, that would be extremely helpful for someone to just be processing the applications as those are coming in and getting those processed out. Um, and just responding to someone who's submitted an application, because as, as you heard in the public comments, there's been people that have submitted their application and haven't heard back in two months. So being able to just acknowledge that we've received their application and it's being processed and letting them know what the next steps would be, um, I think one at least one full-time clerk to be able to do that would be extremely helpful. And then I do believe that we need at least two animal care technician volunteer liaisons at every shelter because one, supervising over 100 volunteers and doing the onboarding and training um, just isn't sufficient. We, we, so we would need at least six additional animal care technicians to have one more at each shelter providing that support for the volunteer program. And I think the more we invest in managing in the infrastructure of the volunteer program, the better it's going to run because right now there, there isn't sufficient staff to do it with, with just the one volunteer liaison at each location. So would this be a, a near perfectly run aspect if we had two? Because I, I think we want to figure out what the ideal is and then push for that rather than uh, just incrementally saying, okay, we could use one more. What, what would be the ideal in terms of volunteer uh, liaisons at each shelter? Well, I, <laughs> ideally, I think, I mean, it, it would probably be based on the number of volunteers per shelter. I, I think it would be fair for a volunteer liaison to supervise no more than 30 volunteers. Um, and considering right now they're supervising 100 or more, um, you know, it, it, and again, it would be based on the number of volunteers per shelter, which does change drastically from one location to another. Okay, and uh, obviously the issue that the LA Times focused on, and uh, I think was the most shocking, is the infrequency at which the dogs get exercise. Um, obviously it's most egregious with evidence animals, um, but there's really no reason why they should be going months without exercise as well. Um, is there any other shelter or department staff that could help with exercising dogs in general? Um, or would that be working out of class? Um, what would prevent us from, uh, from pulling more people into this particular function? So when 
when our staff was involved or able to provide the enrichment, we were running play groups on a daily basis, which was staff run um, when we had the sufficient staff to be able to do so. And it was getting done on a daily basis. I do want to point out though, that not every dog is appropriate to be walked. There are dogs that are being held because they have attacked a person or animal and having them out being walked around in a shelter facility where there are a large number of dogs being moved around um, and members of the public, children running around, it can actually create a very dangerous situation. So we do have to be conscientious that some dogs in our facilities are not going to be able to be walked. Um, as far as hearings go, we do expedite hearings when it comes down to animals that are currently in our care or custody. Um, so we make sure that those are processed out as quickly as possible. But there, there is a length of time because owner, th there are time frames that are actually set in municipal code. So we make sure that we follow those time sets to make sure that we're expediting those, those outcomes. I mean, it it just doesn't seem like a good enough answer. I think every dog should be able to get out of its kennel, even if it's had problems in the past. Um, um, I would disagree, Mr. Kretz, very respectfully, because we have animals that have mauled people. And I am, I am not in a position to force my staff or expect a volunteer to take out a dangerous animal that they are not comfortable with taking out. And there are a lot of animals in our care that the staff are afraid of. So it, it, it would be unreasonable. And keep in mind, we are an open intake municipal shelter. We take in every single animal that comes to our door. We can't turn animals away because they're aggressive or because they've attacked or bitten people. We have to accept those animals and then we have to provide the care for them. And I, I, I don't think we are in a position as a city to force staff or volunteers to handle animals that they're afraid of. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. For, I wouldn't dream of it, especially volunteers. I know we've had people bitten in the past, but are there not people that have the ability to work with difficult animals? And could we not hire them to uh, undertake this specific activity or even on a you know, part-time basis? Are there not trainers that will take a difficult dog and know how to handle them and obviously not doing during uh, normal, whatever I'll say, nine to five hours. Those aren't our exact hours, but uh, normal hours where children are in adopting dogs and families and all that. But uh, more after hours, could they not be given some exercise ever? It, it just seems like not a possibility that we would have to cruelly imprison them. Um, it, it, I, I can't even uh, describe how inappropriate that seems. And there must be best practices somewhere. We don't hear about every shelter in the country not walking their dogs for six or eight months. So we currently don't have any contracts with any organizations to provide um, enrichment for animals that our staff is unable to handle. Um, I do think that we would have to look into the liability issues with it. Um, I am currently in discussion with an organization to help with play groups. Um, but again, they, they will look at the appropriate animals and some animals that are a danger, they, they will not handle. So we would have to look at if there's even organizations out there that would be willing to come in and deal with some of these animals that, that the staff feel that they can't handle. Well, we absolutely should look at such organizations and know that rather than just saying, oh, we don't want to make people that are inappropriate to walk dangerous dogs, walk them, um, that we seek people who are appropriate. Um, now, has the department consulted with uh, our labor partners regarding this issue to see if they have any helpful ideas? We actually meet with our labor partners on a quarterly basis. Um, and we are sensitive to the fact that there are concerns from staff as well regarding some of the animals that are being housed at the shelter. Um, so I, I think that we haven't come to an agreement as to how to properly or best handle some of these animals. And it is an area where um, we are open for suggestions. And I think, you know, looking at an outside organization able to 
provide enrichment for them would be an option. Teresa, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, yeah, so, um, it, and that is correct. We do have a joint labor management committee that meets on a regular basis. I would suggest that quarterly may not be frequent enough under the circumstances. Of course, that does take time away from the um, operation to have those meetings, but they're not excessively long. They're probably around 90 minutes. Um, I think um, for all of uh, folks in the room, we did have at least three animal care technicians and at least one supervisor and maybe another ACO that were waiting in the queue to speak today. But of course, because we had so many speakers, they were not able to get on. I would say that um, the anecdot anecdotal testimony of animals not being fed and given water. I've been working with this department since 1995. I was one of the rep, I, I was assigned to be the union rep to the department at that time, among other assignments. So I'm very, very familiar with the operation. I have never been told by any staff member that they were not able to feed and water animals and clean their kennels on a daily basis. So to the extent that that's happened, I've never been told that by any staff member. So I just want to point out that those are anecdotal uh, opinions, mostly from volunteers. Again, um, for the enrichment, I believe that requires professional staff, as Annette said, to be able to make the judgment call, which animals can be can play together, which animals um, can socialize, and which animals cannot. And that's really a professional judgment. So I would be cautious about um, contracting with private groups or outside groups to do that part of our members' work. Um, and I know we also, as part of the coalition, represent the clerical staff through AFSME. Um, La Uno Local 777 represents the um, supervisors. I'm not sure to what extent those uh, unions have been brought into the dialogue. So we might want to take a look at the composition of the Joint Labor Management Committee, as well as the frequency of meetings. And maybe um, we could get some suggestions from both the commission and your office council member and the other uh, members of the committee as to what their priorities are, what your priorities are for issues that you would like that Joint Labor Management Committee to address um, ASAP. Great, thank you. And uh, uh, question for, for Commissioner Gross and to Animal Services, uh, Commissioner first. Um, department volunteers are clearly a key part of the animal care program. And I know the program somewhat disappeared uh, during 2020 and has been gradually built back up since. Um, what would it take to recruit or activate enough volunteers to help make sure the dogs are getting exercised as much as they need and deserve? From your um, thank, you, thank you, Council Member Koretz for holding this important uh, hearing. Uh, I, I did want to expand also on some of the other issues that were raised in, in uh, perspective from, from a commissioner. And, and clearly... Please, please feel free. Yes. That, and, you know, clearly the mayor, the council, our commissioners, as well as our department staff, mostly who are proud union members, our volunteers and rescue partners, are all committed to ensuring, you know, the health and well-being of our animals in the shelters and out. Uh, in, in the hiring consideration, I, I just want to point out a couple of things, and I'll, I'll address the volunteers as well. Uh, when I was first appointed as a commissioner, uh, way back when, uh, the first thing I did was request to go on a, a ride along with a animal control officer. And it was a very um, eye opening situation. I went to, out of East Valley and on that particular day, there was only one animal control officer for the entire valley because in addition to just having the numbers that we need, we also need to factor in the, the uh, people who are out on medical leave, who are out on vacation. And so I was with this one, one animal control officer. We went to, to uh, the northeast of Valley in Pacoima in one spot. And then we had to drive all the way over to Reseda. And he had the whole responsibility uh, of the uh, Valley. I asked him, I says, is this a regular 
situation. He says, yeah, m most of the time we're, ju we're just understaffed and um, people are out. And so while the staffing issues ex and problems existed uh, before COVID, uh, the pandemic has made such a, a lasting impact on the department and has hit us hard in, in so many ways. I mean, many staff have been out with COVID, as was mentioned. Uh, we've had many who decided not to come back or move on, and it's resulted in, in us closing down shelters. And as you heard from our general manager, uh, at this point, even with opening up those two, two uh, shelters, we still are at the point where we can only adequately cover four shelters. And so, and, and then according to the LA health officials with the latest COVID uh, wave, we have a workplaces that have seen nearly a quadruple uh, since early May. And now just today, they're talking about identifying a new strain in LA County. Um, so the COVID situation is gonna be there. We're, we're gonna continue to have staffing uh, issues in regards to that. And we need to take that into consideration. Um, and while you say we need to hire and hire, I totally agree, funding is the issue, but we don't, we don't control the purse strings. And uh, this has impacted the volunteers as well. And, and due to the COVID protocols, volunteers were not allowed into the shelters and then their participation has been restricted. Uh, and we had to limit the public's access to the shelter, which has uh, bit resulted in a decrease in adoptions. Uh, but we follow the science and we're fortunate we have a mayor and a city council that does so and that we recognize the need to to uh, that the health and well-being of our our residents are as important as our animals, and so so we need to to really be realistic that that this is going to be a, a challenge, and it's good that we're starting to discuss this, uh, but there's no doesn't seem to be a silver bullet, especially with budget cuts and us continually tightening our belt. But as, as Teresa said, you know, animal services is different. Um, we're unlike building and safety or the library or planning because we oversee and care, care for living entities 24 seven. And so it, it just puts more, sh more pressure on our staff uh, and volunteers uh, to, to deal with this. As far as we do need more volunteers, and, and, but clearly the first, I mean, we hire staff uh, staff has that responsibility, and the volunteers are there to fill in and give um, give backup to the to the staff. But it really the buck stops with the staff, and and we need to recognize that, and it needs to be made clear to the volunteers who are incredibly valued. I mean, we need more volunteers. One of the things I, I would suggest is that we we really need to look at this as developing some type of um, Peace Corps uh, effort uh, for animals in Los Angeles. And we really need to do a, a uh, extensive outreach and, and, and media campaign and, and uh, to, to try and bring in more volunteers. Um, now, you know, we need to be clear, more volunteers mean we need more staff to oversee them. Uh, but developing that type of emergency a uh, Peace Corps uh, type effort to solicit new volunteers it, it is definitely needed. And I would highly recommend that we, we look into how we develop that type of campaign uh, to bring in new volunteers. And, and I'd agree with you on that. Although, uh, again, if we don't have the staffing to coordinate our volunteers, uh, if we recruited a bunch of more volunteers, we might make things worse rather than better. So it's got to be a combination, but it, it, it's sort of the uh, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, and we got to do both. I would agree with that. Um, Ms. Ramirez, do you have anything to add on that subject? No, I, I think you guys both hit the nail on the head. Um, we do need more volunteers. I. I I think that right now we already have a very robust volunteer program. Um, so far this year, we've had over 3,500 volunteers give over 37,000 service hours. But again, we don't have, we, we can do this great 
and the volunteers do an amazing job. They absolutely do. They compliment. And a lot of times they are doing the job that we don't have the staff to do, you know, and we, we have become dependent upon them. And I think we need to have the staff to do the basic functions and the volunteers to complement what the staff are doing and, and provide the additional support. So I, but in order to do so, we need the staff to be able to train and manage the volunteer program. Yeah, we're, we're literally uh, facing the perfect storm. We've had a decrease in staff, in volunteers, funding, and resources. We've had less adoptions and more animals coming in to fill our shelters. We are constantly trying to fill up a one-gallon bucket with only a 12-ounce glass of water. And it, it just, you can't do it. Now, the, the department over over many years has experienced friction between some volunteers and some staff. It's not a it's not a, a completely new issue, and typically it leads to a loss of volunteers for one reason or another. Um, we also always hear claims that uh, volunteers have been uh, let go. Um, which is ironic in itself that you can fire volunteers, but uh, that sometimes they're causing problems. Um, more recently, we've heard that uh, volunteers were uh, suspended or let go uh, for talking to the media and saying critical things. So how do we alleviate all of this? And how do we get volunteers and staff rowing in the same direction? So I, I do want to clarify that we haven't suspended or let go any volunteers for what they have said. We do have certain policies and procedures for volunteers to request uh, permission or authorization to speak with the media. And when our policies and procedures are not followed, we do have to enact uh, disciplinary action. And that's kind of what you're hearing going on. But um, what we are working on right now is that uh, to put together a exit interview for, to see why volunteers are leaving. We're also building a volunteer leadership council at every shelter to ad address concerns, training, and empower our volunteers that are leaders so that we can still maintain a safe, orderly, and innovative environment. Conflict with volunteers is actually a small percentage of, of we have, like I said, over 3,600 volunteers that have volunteered so far this, this year. And when there is conflict, it's typically less than a handful of volunteers, which that's a very small percentage of the volunteers that we have. When we do have conflict, it does tend to be very loud and disruptive, and it takes focus away from the animals. But our day-to-day -day experience is that we have great dedicated volunteers that are here to help us and the animals, and they understand our challenges, and they want to be a part of the solution. So how do we deal with our current situation where we've had a few uh, volunteers that have been whistleblowers. And I think, I, I don't know the, the, the exact rules that we put forward, but clearly things were going wrong uh, in the department. And it is not necessarily a bad thing that they came forward and helped to expose it. So, how, how, do, how do we keep people from feeling that they were being punished for exposing things that probably should be daylighted and uh, should get some serious public discussion and this sort of help force it all into the open? And we actually extremely, we value the opinion of our volunteers. They bring a lot of ideas to the table. They see a lot while they're in the shelters. So we, we don't necessarily consider them whistleblowers. The issue is, is when they don't come to us with the concerns and they go to the media or they, they go to other outlets rather than working with us to build, to create a solution to the problem. So I think when we have volunteers that want to work with us, we absolutely work with those volunteers. And then we have some volunteers that are actually, I think they believe they're more of watchdogs over our staff. 
Um, and, and that's, I think, where there, there tends to be friction between staff and volunteers because the, the whole idea of having volunteers is to have them be a part of the team and have them be a part of the solution, see a problem, and help us with fixing it. So, but I do believe that the majority of our volunteers are willing to help us and um, they're willing to br bring solutions to the table and work with us rather than acting as watchdogs. Well, I, I, I think we, this needs more discussion, but uh, I think we can move on for the moment. I think we do have to handle this, this particular area better. Um, are the distinct skills of volunteers matched to the tasks that the department needs? And have we done that to the best of our ability? Yeah, we have tons of different needs within the shelter from the pet food pantry to adoption counseling, small mammals, cats, and so forth. Enrichment is one of the many assignments we have at the shelters. The department is a, able to identify where our needs are and make those assignments and shifts available to the volunteers. Some volunteers do not necessarily want to work directly with animals, but we can still utilize our help in other ways. And some volunteers want to focus on walking dogs. Some prefer focusing on getting the animals out of the shelter by doing the adoption counseling or networking. So we utilize the skill sets of the volunteers to meet our needs and make the different assignments available accordingly. So I think we're, we're kind of one of those departments where we're really lucky because we have so many different ways volunteers can help us. We can always find a way um, where, they're, where, where they will fit with their skill sets and what they're willing to do. And, and as far as shelter conditions themselves, uh, I know our shelter system operated well below capacity in 2020 and much of 2021 largely due to operational strategies that moved a lot of animals out and reduced the influx. Now that we're gradually moving into a post-pandemic phase, although that could change pretty quickly, um, I gather the numbers of cats, dogs, rabbits, etc., are nearing shelter capacity limits, if not straining them. So are we are we at capacity? Are we over capacity? Where are we in terms of our capacity? And what happens if we become more dramatically over capacity? And so there, there's two different types of capacities we're talking about. One is the shelter capacity, is the number of kennels and cages we have, the number of animals we can hold in those kennels and cages. And then the other one is, um, capacity for care. That's what we have the staff to actually provide care for. I believe that right now we are over capacity. We have, you know, in both shelter, um, shelter capacity as well as care capacity. Um, you know, we're often housing more than one dog in a kennel because we are over the shelter capacity and we're unable to have the staff provide enrichment because we're over staffing capacity. If our shelter population is lowered, our current staffing can provide the care needed, but with the current population, we don't have enough staff to provide the enrichment as was previously done, which is why our staff is focusing primarily on the basics of food, water, and clean environment. So, so council members, the other part of this uh, scenario is that we must figure out how to reduce animal intake into the shelter. And keep them in, keep the animals in their homes. And so, you know, spay neuter it needs to be top priority. But we also need to recognize that uh, people who had adopted during the height of the pandemic uh, now face financial challenges uh, of their own or threats to be evicted, and thus believe they have no choice but to surrender their pets back to the intake numbers have soared. So th this means we, we need to look at how we can provide residents more assistance to care for their pets. And currently we operate a uh, pet food pantry at three of our shelters to provide pet food to those who are having a hard time making ends meet. But we need to invest in, in providing residents more financial pet resources, such as expanding the food pantry, affordable uh, veterinary services, and, and more free and discounted spay neuter, neuter services. Uh, you know, people, so currently, 
uh, one of the, the key things, and I, I put on my other hat, uh, people who are facing uh, eviction with their pets are more likely to give up their pets because they're forced to find housing that may prohibit them um, f from having pets there, or the rent increase on that apartment may be unfeasible for them to afford a pen, uh, pet. So currently the COVID eviction protections prohibit evictions for, for pets. We cannot allow that to expire. In fact, we need to expand those protections because in addition to adding to our homeless crisis, evictions also result in increasing homeless pets. And since our cities are rent, a city of renters, that 64% of the residents being renters, getting our animals out of our shelter means that the overwhelming majority have to be placed in rental units. Uh, thus, we need to explore uh, prohibiting rentals uh, from excluding pets and the ability to charge additional pet rents. But we need to look at these broader issues because they all impact the situation we're, we're facing here today. And, and uh, in that direction, but slightly off, uh, that exact topic is, are we doing much in terms of intake counseling? Um, I know, uh, I feel like volunteers may be doing some of it. Um, there may be some staff, but does every person that comes to turn in an animal uh, have someone counseling them on ways in which they could more feasibly keep their animal? and things they should be thinking about. Because I know there's a, a, a certain percentage of people, I don't know what it is, that would keep their animal if their concerns were addressed. Do we have such a program? Is it hit or miss? Is it uh, something that every person turning in their animal uh, uh, has the opportunity to, to uh, access? So when, when we had better staffing numbers, we were doing intake counseling and we were requiring appointments for surrender of pets. So that way, an uh, intake counselor could sit down with a person and talk to them about the reasons that they were surrendering their pet and see if there were solutions or, or resources that we could help connect them with. Um, with our current staffing levels, we have not been able to be consistent with doing the intake counseling. Uh, it's done occasionally, but not uh, as the norm. Um, I think that because our the intake counseling is done by animal care technicians, they and their focus right now is to provide the the basic care for the animals. So we have not been able to maintain the adopt the intake counseling that we were initially doing when we had more staffing and less animals in the shelter to care for. I mean that that seems like one of the most inefficient uh, services to not provide because mm -hmm. if you cut the intake counseling, you're creating more animals in the shelter. And the more animals you have, the more shortage you have of staff and volunteers and whatever. So it seems like rather than, uh, you know, that kind of a vicious cycle, we would want to be sure this was one of the most robust programs. What, what do you think? staffing would take again if we were to hire people just to focus in this area or could we train some of our volunteers and make sure they were well trained and have them pick up some of the slack in this area i'm i'm not too sure if we could have volunteers involved in that role because we do often collect confidential information from the parties that are um, turning in their pets um, you know, but staffing wise, I believe like at some of our larger, busier shelters, we, we would need to dedicate at least two staff members a day. Um, and maybe some of our slower shelters, at least one staff member a day for the, for the intake counseling. But I, I think that you're right. If we, it, it, it's, it's one of those vicious cycles that we we're mopping up the floor rather than turning off the faucet. Um, and, and I think it's really hard to not mop up the floor when what we're looking at are living, breathing animals that need to be fed. They need to be cleaned. They, you know, they need their water bowls filled. So it, it, 
we're kind of in a position with the lack of staffing where there are no good choices that our staff can make. They're in a very difficult position because, you know, yeah, they would love to do the intake counseling, but they have 150 dogs over there that need to be cleaned. So it, it's hard for them to make a determination as to where to focus their energies and help. And um, the focus right now goes to the care of the animals in the shelter. Right. And, and it's, uh, Larry will appreciate this analogy, but uh, uh, we're looking at, at different sources of homelessness and how people become homeless. Um, you know, I suggested a program to, to provide legal uh, representation for people that were facing unjust evictions. Yeah. And for a while, it was difficult to get the program up and running because people would say, well, it costs money. But is it more costly to let someone wind up out on the street and all the services you have to provide and the harm to those people? Or is it less costly just to stop them from winding up on the street in the first place? And I, I think it's a very similar analogy. Absolutely. Is it, is it less costly to stop a dog from going into the shelter or is it you know, more, more costly to pay for their treatment for two or three months until they get adopted. Yeah. Um, and, I, I think we, animal, would, we would always um, say the, it, it makes more sense to be preventative. Yes, and in animal welfare, what the, what the studies have shown is if you every, for every dollar spent up front to prevent that intake, we'll save a municipality $4 on the care and treatment of, of that animal. So it, it, it definitely is putting being able to put those positions up front rather than in the back would be a benefit to the city. Absolutely. And I know on a, on a slightly different topic, some people have criticized the concept of no kill, which is defined as a 90% live release rate and not killing for space. What are the department's prospects for maintaining a good live release rate under the current circumstances where, um, you know, we practically have uh, dogs hanging from the chandeliers. If we had chandeliers, they would be hanging from, um, you know, they're in cages that weren't meant for them. They're, you know, doubling up dogs that probably you wouldn't want to double up in uh, the ideal circumstances. Um, could we return to a situation where we're actually killing purely for space at this rate? So the, the shelter intake comes in, in waves or seasons. There are times in the year when our animal population is low and times when our population is high. And unfortunately, summer is the peak season where our populations are high. This peak happens every year, although we did get relief during 2020 and 2021, but it looks like things are going back to the normal waves that we had pre-pandemic. Although we feel extremely full, we're not at the same animal population we had in 2019, but we are at less staffing due to the vacancies and the COVID-related absences. I believe if we work together with our partners in the community, we'll be able to continue to have over a 94% save rate for dogs because that's where we're at right now. The area where we have struggled with our save rate is with cats. And we did get authorization for two positions for the citywide cat program so that we can hopefully start rolling that out publicly. And the save rate for cats, it, it, we're not going to see an uh, immediate impact to it. It's going to be something that we're going to see over time with sterilizing the three roaming cats that we'll see less and less cats coming into the shelter. Um, but right now we are at a 94% save rate for dogs. It's cats where we're struggling. And I think that um, just as we do every year, we will get through this wave. But having the staffing to be able to help us get through the fact that the COVID absences are having such an impact, um, having more staffing would be extremely helpful. And council member, as you had mentioned, just to remind, in 2012, when, when we started the no-kill effort, uh, only 56% of dogs and cats were making it out of LA city shelters alive. And now we're talking about uh, 94% uh, on dogs. Currently in the US, 
collectively, it's a 79% uh, save rate. So, you know, Lo Los Angeles has always been a, a leader and is, is the largest city in the, the nation who has achieved uh, no-kill. Now, clearly, we dropped a little bit in 2001, but that didn't come due, as far as dogs go, due to uh, issues of uh, space-based euthanasia, if I'm correct on that. Um, Right. And I have a question in a different direction again. Um, I know Best Friends recently announced that they won't renew their contract for the Northeast Valley Shelter and that the commission has approved doing an RFP to seek a new tenant for that shelter, a new operator. I'm aware that the department has held some town halls about the idea to gather stakeholder impact input uh, and all that. Uh, will you be doing that? Uh, additionally before you finalize this RFP? I would have to get back with you on that. I'm, I do know that we have had a request for some town halls to be done. Um, one of the issues with that RFP is that the contract for that facility does expire at the end of this year. Um, so we do have to move very quickly with putting the request out so that there's sufficient time for proposals to be submitted um, and reviewed, selected, and a contract executed. Um, so we are on a very tight timeline here to actually get that done before the end of the year and the end of the current contract. Um, so if we were to hold town halls, we would have to hold them um, very soon. To, to be able to accommodate the, the current tight timeline that we have. Okay, and, and just for the record, I've, I've been told that um, best friends won't just pull out on January 1st whether or not there's a, a vendor to take their place, that they, they will be reasonable and, and uh, continue to function during the transition. Yeah, best friends definitely um, still very much invested in working with LA City Animal Services and they're not pulling out of the city. They're still gonna continue working out of their NKLA center, which is in West LA, um, just a short drive away from our West LA shelter. And um, they, they are absolutely willing to work with the department to make sure that the building doesn't stay vacant for any length of time between us being able to execute a new contract. But we do wanna make sure that we are um, that we still expedite that process because we don't want to place them in a difficult situation because they they are going to be manning their or refocusing um, their focus onto cats and kittens versus dogs. Council member, just a point of information: we um, would prefer to bring that shelter back in house that traditionally has been run by city staff. Um, we did uh, request a meet and confer on that issue and have since filed for arbitration since we did not feel that the department satisfied Article 210 of our contract. Okay. Good to know. All right. This, another area is spay and neuter. Um, I know the department was given more general fund money this year than in past years for spay and neuter. Uh, if you didn't get any additional funding, how many surgeries could you fund this year? Uh, so our 2022-23 adopted budget provided 2,713,000, which will fund um, 3,383 discount vouchers, which is broken down by 1,583 dogs, 1,738 cats, and 62 rabbits. It'll also fund 20,056 free certificates, which will cover the adoption or the sterilization of 8,867 dogs, 10,776 cats, and 413 rabbits. It'll also fund mobile spay neuter vehicles for a total of 10,160 surgeries which is broken down by 5,595 dogs, 4,565 cats. 
and also for our adoption vouchers because we don't do spay and neuter in-house those are actually done out on our voucher program it will fund 17,961 of those surgeries which is broken down to 7,621 dogs 9,439 cats and 901 rabbits and uh, where does the uh, citywide uh, program for surgeries on feral cats fit in? So for free roaming cats, our adopted budget for 22-23 provided 500,000 in the unappropriated balance. And our vouchers are at $70 per cat sterilization. So it'll fund approximately 7,142 surgeries. But we also have funding from the fiscal year 21-22, which provided 550,000 in the unappropriated balance. These funds were transferred over on June 3rd and will fund approximately 7,857 surgeries. So combined with the two, we will be able to provide just under 15,000 cat sterilizations. And will we have the ability to find and trap and spay and neuter that many cats that, uh, that are feral out there and free roaming? So the citywide cat program is the the way it's set up isn't for the department to go out doing the trapping and sterilization it's the community members i do believe that there are a lot of community members that are out there not only um, associated with organizations but private citizens who see feral cats in their yards um, that would be willing to obtain a voucher and get them sterilized and allow them to stay where they're at i i do believe that um one of the challenges obviously that we had with part of the injunction was that we weren't even able to talk to people about sterilization or options other than just turning their animal in. And with being able to now have those conversations with members of the public, I do believe that in a city of over 4 million, there are people that would sterilize at least 15,000 cats. I, I do believe we can find that and, and meet it. Yeah, we had a lot of mention during public testimony about cat colonies. Uh, uh, if there's a large cat colony of 100 cats or 200 cats, which happens sometimes, um, is it the private person that has to be in charge of all that? Or do we have the ability to, uh, to go in and, 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 and trap and, uh, and, and arrange for the surgeries? No, the department um, would not be involved in actually doing any of the trapping. What we're providing are the vouchers so that the, it'll offset the cost of the sterilization for it, but the department won't actually be actively trapping. Do we provide cages for trapping? We, we do have some cages to provide for trapping, but most of the organizations that are out there already have their own that are in good operating condition. But if there are, are people that need to rent, we do have some available for rent. Okay. And I know there's a general shortage of vet, veterinarians in LA and that almost all the spay and neuter clinics and mobile clinics have been unavailable during the pandemic. Uh, which I think explains why the department hasn't spent as much money on surgeries the last couple of years. Uh, what are we doing to, uh, to get through that sort of problematic lull? Yeah, finding uh, spay neuter providers has been a challenge, not just for the community, but for the department as well. We do outsource our spay neuter surgeries because we don't have the medical staff to be able to provide this service in house. The department maintains communication with veterinary professionals to advise of the city's needs and encourage participation in the voucher program. And we also do communication with partners to, we are currently in communication with a partner to provide mobile spay neuter services at our facilities once a week to help with the animals that are getting adopted so that they don't take up kennel space and can be released to the adopter. And should we have a, a veterinarian or two on staff to provide these surgeries? Would it be more cost effective or not? I, I would love to get to the point where we have sufficient medical staff to do uh, spay neuter surgeries in house. Um, we actually, I mean, I've been with the department for 22 years and I don't think we've ever done the, the surgeries in house just because we have not been able to hire 
you know, sufficient staff to do so. The veterinary staff that we currently have, their main focus is providing the care for the animals coming in that are urgent and then providing the treatments and care for the animals that are, are in the facility. So we would, we would have to probably more than double our current medical staff to be able to do so um, because a veterinarian performing the surgeries does need uh, veterinary technicians to assist with the surgeries. And it also takes animal care technicians to be bringing animals to and from. Um, but I, I, I would love to get to the point where we, we are performing these surgeries in house. Um, unfortunately, the veterinary shortage it has impacted, you know, like I said, not just the community, but us as well. We're currently down to veterinarians. So we only have four veterinarians total for the entire city of Los Angeles. Um, so I, I think it, it, it's going to be a while before the um, veterinary community as a whole recovers and we get more veterinary get a larger veterinary pool to be able to, to work with. So I, I think that's, that's going to be a challenge and a, a long-term challenge for us. And how much does the, uh, uh, the backlog of, of uh, space and neuters impact space issues in the shelters? So it, it does come in waves, just, just like the population comes in waves. So, um, we at times will have a backlog of a week where an animal we can't get it into a surgery appointment for you know a week until after it was adopted and those animals we end up having to hold on to because we we you know we can't release them until they've been spayed or neutered um and then at times we're all caught up so it 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 varies throughout the different months and seasons so how do you cope with it when you're behind so how we cope with it when we're behind is that we, we, we work with the animals in the space that we have and we do double them up. We try to figure out which animals can be properly housed together. We try to match them by personalities or play styles. We do house, if animals come in together, we do our best to try to keep them together and house them together. Um, but we oftentimes do have to house the animals together that did not come in together. And, and also, on yet another topic, uh, I know that we're experiencing uh, some equipment maintenance issues in the shelters uh, relating to kennels and subsidence in the kennel area at North Central. Uh, working with General Services and the Bureau of Engineering, how do you manage these problems? And are they being handled in a timely manner? Or uh, are they they uh, far beyond uh, an appropriate timeline and getting handled. So all of the shelter facilities do not belong to the Department of Animal Services. They do belong to the city's general services department. Um, and the department creates work orders for equipment maintenance and other facility needs as soon as we become aware of any issue. We follow up and work closely with general services until the repairs are made. However, because GSD also maintains a number of other city facilities, also dealing with the same limited staffing that all the other departments are dealing with, they prioritize which jobs will be addressed at which times. Um, the, so that, that's how we deal with the, the overall shelter, different repairs that need to be done here and there. There, there was also a question regarding North Central. And in the fiscal year 22-23 adopted budget, we were provided 1.5 million for the North Central Kennel Repair and Renovation. Um, for, for those of you that have seen it, there is one section of what we call puppy kennels that we are unable to use because those kennels are laning. The construction project report request is currently scheduled to be released sometime in August. And once it is released, the Bureau of Engineering will begin working on the design phase of the project. They're also going to start working with the city's geotechnical group to do some ground surveys so that when in design, they can research possible options for repairing or rebuilding the affected area. And they plan to try to meet with them within the next few weeks to get that part of the project started. Um, the design part of the project can take anywhere from two to eight months, depending on whether they go with GSD or a contracted uh, contractor. Um, once the design is completed, we're looking at a year-long construction schedule. 
they're still working with GSD construction forces estimators to get an updated estimate, but they have been seeing an increase in construction forces with costs raising anywhere from 30 to 40%. So they're gonna keep us updated along with the CAO's office. Very good. All right, well, uh, in closing, I'd like to ask everyone on our panel if any of you have additional thoughts or suggestions uh, that the department or the council should be looking at uh, on the topics that we've discussed and any other issues that we might have missed. Well, I, I would actually like to take this moment just to thank the council members for having this public meeting and allowing us to bring to light the challenges that we are facing. I'm an animal lover who's been a part of this department for over 22 years because I absolutely love my peers, my staff, the volunteers, the community members, and the animals that we serve. I want to be clear that our staff work tirelessly. And when our shelter capacity numbers are at what they are currently, with being short staff and having staff going out due to COVID-related exposures, it makes their jobs nearly impossible. I know that the staff work hard and do their best, and they feel overwhelmed and exhausted. There are also times when they are even verbally attacked for their work, but I acknowledge their dedication and their hard work and I value each and every one of them. I do believe more needs to be done like President Commissioner, the Commission President Gross stated to divert intake and we need to look at programs that stop the animals from flooding our shelters. The programs that are out there such as Align Care to provide assistance with medical care to help owners keep their pets or programs such as what Pause for Life has done, which provides free training to dog owners within the city to hopefully prevent uh, owner surrenders due to behavioral issues. We need to look at the collaborations that we can do with organizations to make sure that we're stopping the inflow because right now we're being reactive. We're, we're being reactive and we're not doing what needs to be done to stop the animals from coming into the shelters in the first place. We need to provide additional resources and help to the community so that they can keep their family units intact. And, and, and if I can say, I too uh, want, want to recognize our heroic and amazing staff and volunteers and rescues and partners who've attempted to step up and, and put a collective thumb in the bursting dike. Uh, I really cannot thank them enough. And, and special thanks to, to interim general manager, <laughs> and, and that you've been wonderful. Uh, and uh, I know you're committed as well as your ma management staff in, in trying to, to address these issues. But, but we, we do need to do better. There just cannot be any excuses, and, and we really need to figure out how to address the challenges for the sake of our animals. And so I want to thank you, Council Member uh, Koretz, for, for holding this hearing and starting the ball rolling. I know this is just a new beginning, hopefully, and that we're going to continue to have these discussions and figure out uh, solutions to it, as well as I, I do want to thank the, the mayor's office uh, for the support that they have given. Well, and I want to thank everyone who's participated, the folks that called in, that were able to speak, that weren't able to speak, uh, our, our uh, interim general manager who has taken on uh, uh, a job that uh, could not be more difficult than trying to solve many of the problems in the department. I appreciate uh, Commissioner Gross and the commission for their work as well. Uh, we've got a lot of ideas that I think will help if we follow through on them. We have by and large a great staff. I think we do have to figure out if there is any process to uh, deal with a, a relative handful of those that are not so great on staff. Um, it's gotta be difficult for the folks that are incredibly dedicated and putting in long hours and working their tails off uh, for those that, that aren't. Um, I think we, we are reliant on our volunteers to some degree, and I don't know that that's a terrible thing. I think they have important roles to play. Um, it shouldn't all be trying to fill in the, the gaps that are left by not being adequately staffed. 
Um, ideally, uh, you know, they would be doing the things that that uh, are are valuable for the well-being of of the animals, uh, especially exercise and play. And uh, uh, ideally, they shouldn't be doing the things that are riskier and more difficult. Um, but we all have to pull together and, and do what we can. Um, I know that uh, I have spoken with some volunteers too. And, uh, you know, there are volunteers that, that I don't know about, to know them well enough to know their credibility. And there are volunteers that I know well enough to know that I would, uh, I would stake my life on their truthfulness. And we have heard from uh, folks in all categories that uh, uh, there are many areas of our shelter operations that are desperately lacking. Um, and so hopefully this is uh, the first step in a significant change and uh, and making our shelter system uh, one that we can again be more proud of. So I thank everyone for participating. We look forward to having a next meeting on just this topic, um, hopefully in August, and pushing for significant changes in the department and hopefully significant improvements uh, starting the ball rolling. So thank you, everyone. And uh, Mr. Clerk, is there anything else on our agenda? No, that uh, clears the desk. That being the case, we are adjourned.